Hi, it's Rick Glassman from the Take Your Shoes Off podcast. And this week, we're taking a page out of the Disney playbook and releasing an episode from the vault. The Patreon vault, that is. At the Take Your Shoes Off Patreon, we have exclusive episodes. We show what happens between the haps, the snaps, on a fun segment we like to call Behind the Snaps. Extended endings, more BTS stuff. We do group Zooms. I also have a special Patreon Discord. If you want more information, you could go to patreon.com slash take your shoes off or the link in the blah, 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 yada, yada. You get it. Okay, straight from the Patreon vault. For those of you non-patrons, you get exclusive ad access, exclusive access at one of the episodes. My name's Rick Glassman and scoot do bubbity boo. Uh, I'm nervous. You're nervous, huh? I'm nervous because like you have comedians on here and I'm, I'm funny. I mean, many people have said I'm one of your funniest friends, if not the funniest friend and that there's a lot of pressure. But I think I'm funny in a different way. And the second that I either feel like uh, I can't keep up or I'm going to say something hurtful because a lot of teasing and a lot of like funny stuff is, is you know, razzing people. And I'm just not it, it, it kind of freezes me up. Well, we'll have to make sure we don't razz you too much. All right. I appreciate that. Yeah. Scoot do. Blabbity blue. Scoop D. Oh yeah! My hair <laughs> very long. Uh huh. A little unsure of and, uh, whether or not I want to wear a hat during it. Don't. Your hair looks great. And just so you know, people don't really tell can tell the difference. People what? People can't really tell the difference. Uh, la last few episodes, people have been saying. Rick, your hair sucks. I'm unsubscribing. <laughs> God, you have a really um, observant fan base. Yeah. And mean. Jeez. Oh, hi, ladies. Hi. 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 This episode is brought to you by Noom. Wait a minute. My neighbors have lost so much weight and they do Noom. Sign up for your trial and get psychology-based support and motivation to reach your goals at noom.com slash Tyso. That's Noom, N-O-O-M dot com slash Tyso to sign up for your Noom trial today. Yeah. So, Dave, mm -hmm. um, I have talked about you probably in like 10 episodes, little things here and there, and I'd love for the people to be able to meet you. Well, thank you. I know you're nervous, uh, <laughs> and that uh, I'd like to take, no surprise, take the reins for a second then. Please do. And talk to you about how I just did a podcast. I don't know when this is coming out, but chances are the one I just did, the Taron Killam one. You had him on before. I had, to, but it hasn't come out yet. I just recorded it. No, you've had Taron Killam on before. Yeah. yeah. This this isn't a Taron Killam issue. Okay. This is a Rick Glassman issue that happened while Taron was sure. here. It could have happened. I don't know about with anybody, <laughs> but it could have happened with most people. Well, if you were there, then it could have happened with anybody. I don't think it would happen with you. Oh, okay. I think with you. Uh, excuse me. I don't think it would happen with somebody who I'm closer with. Oh, gotcha. I know Taron. Uh, we're friends. Yeah. But. I don't know him that well. Yeah. Right. And I am normally uh, I'm ready before the guest gets here. Uh, that's not because I'm being polite to them, but I, I know I always want to be ready right. um, for a few reasons. It's professional, but also I want to be recording as they walk in in case there's any fun opening. Yeah. And he got here and I was just I had an adrenaline rush. I was already like, I don't want to be late. And I set everything up and everything isn't going the way I wanted it to be. And I'm just like not in a creative space. And I was just so I, I was feeling uh, I was feeling the way I feel. I'm sure I will again, but it's been a while. But I used to feel a lot on stage and I felt as a kid when you have to do 45 minutes, especially, but anything like 20 or more, like a half hour, 45 minutes where it's like for me not in my safe space. I'm comfortable with 20. More than that, it's, you know, I'll do it. Yeah. But I, I haven't done more than 50 of those ever. Yeah. If it doesn't, if it starts off bad and I know I have to do another 40 minutes, I don't know what to do. Mm -hmm. I get cold. I, I, the, it's embarrassment. It's embarrassment. What could he have said to make you feel 
like it actually wasn't a big deal and that it actually was fine. There's nothing that he can do then. Because basically it seems like you're, you're obsessing over these little things that don't really matter. Right. And it's not helping you and it's making him like, oh, well, I said it's fine, but he's still obsessing about it. Like, well, what am I supposed to do? It like, how, how can I make you I feel know. better? It wasn't the situation that was making me feel that way. It was a situation that triggered something in me. I mean, it makes sense knowing that about you. It doesn't make sense for me because, yeah, there are just things that I don't care. I don't care. Maybe I don't care enough. Maybe, you know? but that's not fair to say because <clears throat> there are so many things that I don't care. Yeah. Or it's not that I don't care, but it doesn't affect me necessarily. Yeah. You know, uh, you are talking about how you were, were and or are nervous about this podcast. Yeah. And I'm thinking, who, who cares? Yeah, 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 yeah. But sometimes you get triggered. A person gets triggered. Yeah. And embarrassment, I'm happy to say I don't have much experience with these days. <laughs> so when I do, I either don't have the tools or it takes something very embarrassing. I don't know what it is. Yeah. But w when I tell you I was in, it was all day, I, I, I still, it's been, it's been less than a week, but it, I don't know when it was, but I'm still feeling embarrassed and I'm sensitive. I'm extra sensitive right now. Like you, do you, you hold yourself at such a high standard that there's no room for mess ups, but I don't see that. Maybe in this podcast, I, you have such a, you hold yourself and say, am I doing something? You hear in the, the static? I mean, I hear it, but I don't hear it now. It, it, I don't know. I don't know how to, I don't know the answer to that. I, I, I know that, I know that I feel that I, you know, everybody feels, at least they, hopefully they feel that they offer value. Sure. And sometimes that value is something you made up. Sometimes it's only part of what you're really worth. Yeah. But uh, on a subconscious level, if you feel that you're not of value, then it's, sh you know, I wanna, I'm embarrassed, I, I'm, I'm sorry, or I, I don't want to be here, or especially when I'm not only showing, not only are a lot of people seeing this, I'm choosing to show it to them. I say, mm -hmm. hey, watch this. Mm -hmm. Then you add on top, this person came over, they have a family, they don't leave their house much. They made a commitment to me mm -hmm. when I'm not able to show up for them, yeah. for them, yeah. for me, yeah. and the stakes are rel are very small. But see, that's not true. You did show up. You did show up for him and for them, and you did line up all the equipment, and you did do everything that you normally do. There was just something going on that day. I don't know. I mean, I I I know that there's like a standard of quality that you want to have and that you want to you want people to see. But at the end of the day, they just like you. Like, yeah, you, you have cool stuff in the podcast, but like if you if you weren't any good or if like you did dumb jokes, like people wouldn't watch. But what? But I I wasn't there. I wasn't there with them at the beginning or at all. So there's got to be something that you need to tell yourself then like, oh, wait, no, this doesn't really matter. Or like I am good enough. or I am funny. Like it doesn't matter if this stuff's buzzing. Yeah, you like, know, yeah, his voice is going to be different, but like they've come to expect that they know I'm doing this all on my own. It's not just about them. It's me watching this thing and not being happy with it. But you, you got to give yourself some credit in what it is that you are doing. Like these things are going to happen. Yeah. And and yeah, I can kind of freak you out for a little bit. But like at the end of the day, like, does it really matter? No, no. The, this thing that happened with Taryn has happened before with other guests. Um, and, some, you know, you come back sometimes quicker than others. And uh, both Betty and Dane Cook separately gave me the same piece of advice, which is something that they, I believe they both heard this from Stern. I know at least Dane did. But just something that is probably so obvious to everybody. Yeah. Have questions written down prepared. I always have questions I want to, but then I, it's very extemporaneous. Yeah. But to have, que and I have had these for, for months and months now. I have a book with questions written down that I'll probably get to, but it's fine if I don't. But the reason they're there is when I'm floundering, I know, all right, to, to stop it being about me, yeah. let me just read this question yeah. and let him go. Yeah. So I did that. And there yeah. were questions I care about. He was yeah. a voice on The Simpsons. Yeah. Oh, wow. I asked him about it. He's telling me. And as he's telling me, I'm noticing myself being interested. I'm noticing myself being glad I'm interested. I'm noticing myself noticing these things. Good. I'm noticing myself then not being completely there with him because I'm noticing these things. Right. It then opens these doors to other things to notice, which is 
even though it's okay because it's a tool, I do feel like I'm lying to him because I asked him this question in this moment as an excuse. And with that, I'm now not being able to listen. And by not yeah. being able to listen, I'm now going back to I'm um, not pr- – it's – you spin. Wow. I spin sometimes. With or, that. or I'm doing something that somebody that I really respect uh, advised me to do, and it's working. Oh, this is kind of cool. It, 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 you kind of have to change your mindset around it. Instead of like I'm cheating or I'm doing something that I wouldn't normally do and I'm no longer present, it's like, oh, okay, yeah, I'm starting to feel better. Oh, I'm starting to feel interested. Like start focusing on the positive things that are now happening because you use this tool that you now have. As opposed to like this feels weird. I feel a sense of responsibility to maintain – a brand great and i have fortunately made the decision to showcase me being aggressive me talking too much me not talking enough sometimes me being really funny me being not so funny in a way to like as a whole this is all who i am there That's are s- but there are some episodes where i feel so vulnerable and i don't want to post it um And I'm embarrassed. I'm embarrassed to show it to Betty to watch it. I'm embarrassed to put it out and and see what the comments are. And and I've decided to put them out anyway because, and this is corny, but this is who I am. Yeah. And it's a lot easier to curate by just not needing to touch stuff up. Yeah. But it still does not diminish the fear I but get still, Ricky, that, of vulnerability. That in itself is part of your growth. Like you say that, you know, you still have a kid brain, but like this is you deciding to put it put it out, feeling vulnerable, feeling exposed, feeling somewhat like, oh, I'm giving them too much. You put it out and that's going to make it easier next time that you feel this way. And next time and next time and next time. It makes it easier for me to remind myself yeah, it's that okay. it's going to be OK. <laughs> yeah. It's still has not gotten easier. Yeah. Yeah, it. Mm, I don't it know. Well, it, but because it hasn't happened enough. Maybe, thankfully. Yeah. I'm sure that, that whenever the next time it happens, it's not going to feel nearly as bad as the first time it happened. Like anything. You know what I mean? It just gets, it gets easier. It gets better. Could you give that advice to yourself? Uh, yeah. Yeah. I, I, I would have to look. Yeah, I mean, I sometimes do that. Like, I, I wanna, whenever I feel like, yeah. You want to keep going or stop? Uh, no, you can keep going. I'm sorry. I just yeah, no, that's okay. Sh- I didn't turn um, your screen. I want to make sure it's working. I, I sometimes when I when I feel like I'm not a good actor or like, man, I'm not in class anymore. Like I'm not teaching anymore. Like, am I still good? Am I still good at what I'm doing? And am I getting better? Am I getting worse? And then I'll go back and look at a tape from like five years ago where I thought that tape was good. And then I look at it and I'm like, oh my gosh, like I've grown so much. Like sometimes you have to be reminded that, oh, just me moving forward and me putting one foot in front of the other and me staying in L.A. and continuing to audition, I'm getting better. Like even golf today, I'm, I'm not good at golf, but and I probably shot a, 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 I, I shot in the hundreds, which I don't do very often. But like I got better today as frustrated as I was I only threw my club once. But like I got better, like there, there was something that I knew that I realized that I was I was moving my wrist for or uh, yeah, I was moving my wrist forward too soon. I don't want to diminish your analogy, but you don't have value and identity in you as a golfer. So I would love for you to kind of. But as an to- athlete, like I, I grew, I played five sports in high school. That was very much my identity. College like I, football, division one. Yeah. Um, uh, soccer, L- yeah, whatever. Baylor. Um, but anyway, like that, that's very much my identity. So me being good at sports. Yeah got me a lot of adulation and a lot of respect and a lot of women um, uh, when I was younger. And so that really is a big part of my identity mm-hmm. now. I understand. So, yeah, being on the golf course and knowing, man, I suck at golf. Like golf is one of the few sports that I suck at, but I continue to play because I know as I get older, my my body is not the same that it used to, even though my mind, in my mind I think I can do the things I used to. Yeah, just animate your yeah. body just <laughs> – during the podcast. Um, uh, <laughs> uh, but yeah, just uh, giving myself patience and room to know that like, oh, I'm getting better. And by the time I'm 50 years old, like I'll be able to hit that shot a little more regularly. Even though I threw my club, I mean, I threw it. I mean, the club went further than my, my tee shot did. I threw the club because so, I was like, oh, I know how to throw. I threw my club and it was, went so far. Why did it take but, you almost a year to agree to do my podcast? I was nervous. And and. I didn't want to feel exposed and I didn't 
as close as I am to you, I I feel like we could have slid into some areas that I wasn't so comfortable talking about. And also, you have such funny friends. And I didn't want to come on here and be the boring guy. And, you know, instead of your podcast getting 50,000 views, it only gets like 500. And I'm like, oh, gosh, that's not going to make me feel very good. Well, what made you decide to do it? Uh, you said that it was going to be a Patreon. And right. that gave me a little bit of comfort. Because less people are seeing it is less, less people seeing it or less people seeing it. There's less expectation for the episode to do well. Uh, both. Both. Less people... I mean, I want it to be good regardless, but the fact that I feel like it's for a more private audience, it's like, all right, cool. That's okay. Like, yeah, these are for like Rick's real fans, mm -hmm. you know, so it's kind of a curated audience. But like now that we're sitting here and we're going through it, it's like, oh, this isn't so bad. I felt you would feel that way. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, and also in my mind, I haven't done anything like this before. You like, haven't done a podcast. You've done podcasts, haven't you? I mean, maybe one or two, but they were very like specific to teaching. We're, we're, we, we kind of buried the lead here with who David is. So let's real quick just let people know who you are. Uh, and, you know, a part, I, I want to say it. I felt, I'm feeling myself wanting to say it for two reasons. One, to prove to you I know who you are. And two, to not speak for you. Okay. Um, but also, I don't want to throw you on, put you on the spot. That's but okay. If, uh, could you tell people who you are in a minute? <laughs> Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm an actor. Uh, I moved out here, uh, talk about, about the, pri the, the primer story. That's very interesting. Yeah. Um, so my first movie I made, uh, after I graduated college, I worked for a software company. Four months later, I got laid off. I was depressed without really knowing why. <laughs> no, I'm just joking. I'm just joking. I'm, uh, the uh, only reason I did that is because you didn't want to be boring. I was 100% joking. Uh, um, uh, I do have to interrupt you though. Yeah. If that were real and or even if it's not and that reminded something of you, which yeah. seeing your smile, I feel like it did. Uh -huh. Could you empathize with that feeling of even if the, the adult in you is saying I am interesting or it doesn't matter if I'm interesting the whole time or whatever, that part where you're in your head thinking about it, it's not allowing you to do other things. Could you relate to that at all? Would it be harder for you to tell me this story if right before I said... I, it's boring, but I just want people to know. Could you just do it? But uh huh, that would have been that would have been easier for me than dealing with you just doing that because I me doing what that, you that do, joke? Yes, yes. because yes. I I I I know I know enough about this story that if you say, hey, can you tell the folks your story and you start doing whatever, I could get into it and I can tell the story. But like with you doing that, it's like, oh wait, do I need to respond back and fire back at you and like make a joke back at you? Because I'm already feeling a little defensive in the fact that I don't like talking about myself. Uh -huh. And the second I start talking about myself, you do that. And I'm like, oh, man. Yeah. You know? uh, well, I, I want to apologize okay. for giving you feel that way. But I also want to ask your permission to kind of play with that a little bit throughout this. Because that's the stuff that's happening to me right now. And... I feel like maybe we could connect on it. Okay. Unless that's bullying. What, what do you mean? What, that's the stuff that's happening. Because you, you wanting to make fun of me? No, 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 no. The, the, the feeling I was having that I was trying to explain to you that happened to me when all my equipment's breaking. And you're like, it doesn't matter. Yeah. And I'm saying, yeah, but my tongue is burnt. Yeah. And now I'm feeling this way. Right. I'm, that's, I, saying this now, it actually feels like a mean thing. And I, I think that's wrong. And I'm sorry. But I'm feeling myself trying to be like, I want you to feel what I felt. I don't want you to feel what, what, you, what I felt so you're uncomfortable. I wanted you to experience what I felt so we could connect mm. on that part of it mm. throughout. Mm -hmm. Because you and I are very different performers. Yeah. But we both, and maybe this is self-indulgent to say, but I feel that we both have a very strong relative skill set to be, be be defined be very present, present yeah uh in our own ways yes and when I, I what's my biggest strength as a as an actor i feel like is is when i'm able to when i'm present i feel like i'm, 100%. I'm right totally agree so when i'm not able to be present yep i'm nothing yep whether that's true or not yep. it's self-fulfilling yep 
So having this conversation with you where I'm realizing you're giving me advice, I guess it's a little manipulative. I'm sorry, but I'm finding a way to make you feel not present to, to talk about that presently. Okay. Does, does that make sense? A little bit. I don't know what you want me to do with that information. But yeah, I, I understand by you doing that, it took me out of being present. But then you pointed it out. And then so I was like, oh, okay, well, I need to joke back. Like I would have kept going. Do you know what I mean? If I, I snored and then say just joking. I would have been like, all right. And then I would have kept going. And then you eventually get out of your head once you continue the story for long enough or you're always in your head from there on out. No, I would get out of my head. Yeah, because it's like, okay, people want to hear this story. Like people don't know that I won Sundance my first time to act. Like people don't know that I was, I'm going to list my resume now because it, it yeah. looks like it's, it's, uh, it's, it's present and it's not planned. That I was nominated for an Independent Spirit Award. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, and I, I took my mom as my date because... Uh, Explain what Independent Spirit Award is. So uh, it, it's, it's basically... And you, didn't uh, say, you didn't say this yet, but he did not, you didn't study acting. I didn't, no. And you were not an actor before no. this job. Yeah, right, correct. I was a business major. Um, independent Spirit Awards are basically the Oscars for independent film. So the at Sundance. At, at, well, not necessarily at Sundance for because some films don't get into Sundance. Well, it's I'm for, saying your yours was at also is at the biggest film festival. Correct. My film won the Alfred P. Sloan Award and uh, and the best feature, the the Grand Jury Prize at Sundance. And there's also an award show called the Independent Spirit Awards, and that's for all independent film. And so there are some films that were nominated as for an Independent Spirit Award that weren't at Sundance. Because Sundance, you know, can Sundance, like there's, there's a handful of like the top uh, film festivals, but sometimes these films don't even get in. And the programmers and the, the researchers and, and the staff for uh, Film Independent, they find these performances in these films and, and these directors and writers that they think need to be nominated and, and need to have, get credit. Did you and, know how, how difficult it was to have a film get into Sundance when you first did it? No, because I really didn't know anything about Sundance. Um, I, I, I knew who Robert Redford was, obviously, and, and I, 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 I knew of Cannes and I knew of Sundance. What does Robert Redford have to do with it? He's the one who started Sundance, Sundance Film Festival. Um, and so I, uh, uh, you can cut that out because I don't want you to feel st stupid. Um, when I burped? <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, when you said Robert Redford. I, I'm, joking. I, listen, I'm joking. I know you are. And, and but that was mean, and I felt bad no, halfway not, through the joke. No, what I'm laughing at. Was yeah. after you said it, the way you the way you hugged me by going like this. Oh, you could take it out. <laughs> like you leaned forward and you laughed a yeah. little. Let me know you were joking. Yeah, 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 yeah. If I say, hey, you're a dumbass for not knowing that, that he started the Sundance Film Festival. If I go and then you go and then continue and, and I don't explain it. Yeah. Or you don't acknowledge yeah, it. Yeah, I'm yeah. an asshole. Yeah, exactly. But if I do the same exact joke, even something meaner. Yeah. And you laugh and go back to me. It's, yeah. oh, look at their rapport. Yeah, yeah, right, right, right. So what I say or what you say is decided based on how the other person receives it. Yeah. When you apologize to me for making a mean joke, uh -huh. um, that is the meanest you could be to me. Apologizing. By, yeah. I didn't like the way it made me feel. Because I'm not, I, at my core, I don't think I'm a mean person. And... I kind of live in a way, treat other people the way you want to be treated. Right. And what I said at the beginning was like, hey, Rick, don't make fun of me on camera because I don't know how I'm going to react. And then I turned around and did the same thing. And I didn't like the way it made me feel. So I was like, I'm sorry. You it's so complicated. Yeah. It's so simple too. But you treat people the way you want to be treated. So do I. Yeah. And by me treating you the way I want to be treated, <laughs> you are insulted and not wanting me to do to you, but not allowing you to do yeah. that to me, which yeah. is how I want to be treated. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And we know that. Yeah. I think the camera does a little bit, causes a little bit of the disconnect. To whom? Because, well, just keeping it in me saying, hey, you should know who that is. Then I was like, oh, man. That was I was a dick like that. And, and there's people watching. So if there's no cameras and we're on the couch. I don't think I would have apologized. I would have think like, Rick, what's wrong with you? You don't know who Robert Redford is? You don't know. The f Jeez. So you were less worried about how I would feel and more worried about how you would be perceived. That means. Well, the fact that you didn't have a face immediately, like you didn't respond immediately. I was like, oh, shit. That made me realize I need to say something and I need to qualify. But what if the cameras weren't on and I, and I didn't make a face? It would have gone I under guess the radar? The stakes, yeah, I, I guess the stakes are lower. I guess like I feel like, oh, 
you know, Rick and I would do that to each other. Like, he, yeah, so, he, and you would say to me, oh, shoot, yeah, you're right. I, I should have known who, who that was. And then it's a different conversation. Do you, th- uh, uh, do you think that's manipulative to then change the way you're talking to me because the cameras are on? Manipulative to who? The audience or to you? Uh, I mean, to the audience through me. Is it lying? Is it lying to say, I would normally make that joke to you, but because the cameras are on, I feel like I need to, I f- it made I me feel know. bad. I think it's, a, I think it's a, a certain awareness that I have now that I've probably just developed in the last like five or six years. Like, you're always being watched. Like, Who's and you? You. People who have, who have decided to pursue something in the public eye. Right. Like, I, what was I watching? I was just watching something the other day. Highlander? Oh, no. I was watching the Tiger Woods thing, uh, the documentary about Tiger Woods and like how he went to the clubs. <laughs> what? I didn't hear what you said. <laughs> Sorry. Just, just, just the Highlander oh. uh, versus Tiger Woods guest is just, you know, way off. <laughs> oh, I don't know who Highlander is. Um, uh, so anyway, I was watching the Tiger Woods thing and... It would it, it, the scandal for people who hadn't seen it. The second the second episode is is the scandal about Tiger Woods mm-hmm. and all the women and and it was like there was like grainy footage of him in a club, and it was like oh yeah that was before cell phones, so I mean I guess I'm saying all that to say that that I'm aware that if I say or I do something that's kind of out of line, yeah, there may be costs, and so that's the that's the big <clears throat> that's the that's the big obstacle of yeah. being a public personality now yeah. Yeah. Um, and so much. But so, I'm obviously I'm going to be more whether it's manipulative or not. I think it's just conscious. I'm going to be more honest and straightforward and, and revealing to you than I am if, if I do. You know, when I do press for the, the TV show that I'm on. We have these conversations all the time off yeah. camera. Yeah. Um, anyway. Yeah. So uh, thank you. I, I'm sorry if I if you feel like I'm wasting time with this. No, I don't. I, 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 you know, I just don't want to be the boring episode that only gets 400 views. That's another thing that <laughs> Dane said to me recently. Uh, I talk to Dane Cook every now and then. Uh-huh. Um, uh, uh, and I, I, when I say that... Uh, Have you had him on yet? No. Uh. Um, he was kind of come over before the new setup. Yeah. Before I moved. Yeah. Uh, and I couldn't have him when he was able to come. And then he... And I understand he wanted to wait until after I figured sure. this out. Uh and that makes sense. I mean, I have yeah. stuff breaking all the time, so that's fine. But for whatever reason, we'll go you know a long time without talking, and then sometimes we just chat, you know, a, a few times, like once a week for a little bit, and they're yeah. long chats. And good. Uh, Dane has, you know, I mean, yeah. Dane has, he's been in this business for a while, and yeah. he has a lot of people that ha- hate on him, yeah. um, uh, and a lot of things that that maybe he's done wrong, maybe he's he's done that. He, he, the people didn't give him the benefit of the doubt mm-hmm. all to say that he's a, a well of knowledge for yeah. somebody who's literally been at the top and experienced all, everywhere in between yeah and not that other people don't but I give that a lot of weight sure and he has things to say that that are actually like they're not inspiring I mean maybe they're inspiring but they're not it's like oh they're they're literal things that uh, tangible things that I take yeah. that I and one of them is this that is uh, he t- he talked to me about this one after the the Terran episode, and you said something like this kind of, um, which is, you ha- he said to me you, you have to remember that as much as I want me Rick wants this to be a certain thing and I want this to be special and you you know the other person feels that I'm coming into Rick's place his world he does all these special edits he is doing stuff quick I want to be able to keep up and blah blah blah. And I never had that perspective. And like you wanted to get a lot of views. So do I. I don't want to be the reason your episode doesn't do well. It's not that you aren't good. <laughs> you won't ever be the reason why my episode doesn't do well. But as the host of this show. No, it's never going to be you. I would never have somebody on who I didn't feel was going to be a good episode. So if it's not a good episode, I have to take responsibility for it. Oh, okay. And it's, it's a big load off to think that the other person feels a sense of responsibility yeah they do you not wanting to be boring is me not wanting to give you questions and talk about stuff that you don't feel you could shine in yeah anyway 
Yeah. Um, it's that's kind of like a, a backwards approach of that thing that I never understood, which was picture picture the audience naked. Yeah. I never really. What is that going to do besides give me a boner? Yeah. It's <laughs> that. Oh, they feel vulnerable. It makes it easier for me. Uh huh. Anyway, do you remember where we are? No. Are you? How do you feel? I I, I feel better. Yeah. yeah I, I feel are you better. in and out? No, no, no. I'm di- I'm very much in. And I've also felt like, oh, well, if this is boring and it only gets a few hundred views, it's not because I'm boring. It's just because like our conversation is not typical of what you know what you usually do. Usually, What's typical? There is nothing just typical. Just the bits and like all the comedy and the the you know just all the fun stuff. Like I don't think people are gonna laugh at this episode. Like when I watch your stuff with all the other people, I'm laughing and I'm like, God, I love that. And so there's like, you know, which I guess that's kind of the energy that I have, and me also not being as confident in my timing and my ability to keep up it's actually probably serving me you know like oh well this is yeah he's an actor he's not a comedian he doesn't he doesn't have to like do all the stuff you struggled uh with you're an actor not a comedian a bit because most of your friends are comedians yeah you feel that you don't have an identity as a comedian and you and you want one because people you're not seeing it now but uh Truly, you are one of my funniest friends, and you're not a you're not a comedian. I guess if it's defined by somebody who goes on stage to tell jokes, yeah. But you are. I mean, it's so corny this term, but you're so present with me. I mean, probably with other people, but I only know you with me. Yeah. And the things you say, you're you're so funny, and when do you know that, or when? What what is that feeling? How could you explain? Well, yeah, I think just I was lucky because in high school, like I said, I was the athlete, but also, um, where was I? Uh, anyway, in high school, I was the uh, the yeah. I'm starting to bore myself. So. I don't want to force you into doing a bit back, but okay. also you have to respect <laughs> that that's the time to snore. Of course, <laughs> but I sat at the table with all the funniest people in high school, and like we would just go back and forth and, and making each other laugh. And there was this one kid named Brant Plaster. Shout out to Brant. We'll put his yeah, Instagram handle Brant. up here. Um, we would wait for him to take a, a drink of his milk. And then we'd do a joke because he would shoot the milk out of his, he's like, he'd start laughing and he'd shoot the milk out of his nose. And he hated it. And we all loved it because it was like, <laughs> he would make just this big mess all over the table. So I've always been around the funniest people. Were you one and, of those people? I was at the table and I was able to keep up and those people were my best friends. Do you feel like they felt the same thing about themselves that they're at the table? Yes, about themselves. I don't think that they thought that about me. I don't think that they would be like, man, Sullivan is hilarious. Okay. But my buddy Jason Henry and David, like my, my high school buddies were the funniest people. And I think when I came out here, um, came out here by myself and... I didn't to tell that tell that also the the, a bridge version because I want to make sure we get that you came here by yourself the Sundance thing that brought you out here connect those for me real quick say again connect those for me that's the the process of so we won Sundance in January Um, I still had a job I was working for AT&T I didn't know like does that make me a movie star like what does that do I was lead of a movie is nominated for uh, awards Um, it wasn't until July uh, that I, I came out here for a couple meetings uh, you had never done anything. No, no. They I, asked I, you to be an actor on the set. Yeah. You were also a PA. Yeah. And you literally did all the jobs just yeah. to make this small little thing happen. Yeah, yeah. You win this huge award at yeah. the biggest festival. Yeah. And now you're like, I guess I'll go out to LA. Yeah, right? that was exactly what it was. Like I was flying back and forth from meetings and I had a job at the time and uh, my boss was like, hey, can you go pick up this paperwork on Friday? Or uh, yeah, tomorrow it was Thursday. And I, I was in LA. And I was like, oh, shoot, uh, how do I tell him uh, I can't go pick up the paperwork? I was like, yeah, you know, I'll pick it up on Monday. And um, and he was like, no, we really need that in by Friday, blah, blah, blah. So I told him, I was like, I'm in L.A. Uh, you know, I was at Sundance six months ago. Like, I have more opportunities out here. And he was like, oh, well, I kind of have to fire you. And I'm like, yeah, I guess so. So I moved to L.A. Like I said, didn't know anybody. Waiting tables, doing the things that actors do. Um and I, uh, Ben Glebe was handing out flyers on the promenade, which is where I was working at the time. And he was like, Hey, you want to go to a comedy show? And I was like, for free. And he's like, yeah. And I was like, Ben yeah. Glebe is a, is a comedian, yeah. uh, who 
uh, is is super Jewish and funny. Uh, we'll cut to a clip. <laughs> Rick, Rick, Rick. Here's how it works, my friend. You and your partner, David Finn, who is backstage and cannot hear us, will have a combined 40 seconds to answer the exact same test. Whenever you lock in and stop the clock, whatever time is remaining is all that your partner will have left to answer. If only one of you gets it right, you get out of $1,000. But if you both get it right, your charities get $100,000. $10,000. $10,000! So Numa's here to change your mind about how you see and feel about food. Yeah, with a psychology-based approach. It's not about good and bad foods, and I think that's really, really important. Uh, Betty is a clinical nutritionist. She helps me out with this stuff all the time, too. I never even realized how much there was to this. What's great about the app is it kind of walks you through it, and it's not like you have to go to college like she did. You spend 10 minutes a day on this thing to check in. It's like you have somebody there who's motivating you, but also teaching you. You know, it's hard to lose weight, especially at a certain age, and this is the kind of thing that helps you feel good about how you do it and why you do it, as, as opposed to making you feel guilty all the time. Eric, will you do me a favor? Mm. And will you guys do me a favor? What's that, Rick? Come on, I can't hear you. Will you do me a favor? What's that, Rick? Start building better habits for healthier, long-term results. Sign up for your trial at Noom.com slash Tyso. That's N-O-O-M dot com slash T-Y-S-O. Snap with me, baby. Hello. We interrupt this episode to invite you to join our Patreon. Here's a clip from this exclusive episode with Melissa Villasenor. All right. I think our improv scene was hilarious. Yeah, I thought it was really good. Um, <laughs> I thought it was really, really, really good. <laughs> Okay, what are we doing? Tell me. Um, you have a local ice cream shop, and I'm the, <laughs> the, who's the person that makes the A's and B's, rates, rates the shops, restaurants? The food uh, uh, inspe health, health uh, inspector, health grade inspector. Yeah. So I, I'm coming by to tell you I'm giving you the boot. Give me the boot or giving me a bad <laughs> grade? Oh, giving you a bad grade. Okay. Uh, <laughs> All right. There you go. Oh, you could just throw it anywhere. It doesn't really matter. We'll uh we'll clean it up when we get to it. Um Hi. Hey. Hey, uh, uh Teresa, are you must be are are you the owner, Mr. Jeff Frosty? Mr. Fro Jeff Frosty? Yes, I am. <laughs> okay, Jeff. Can get your scoop. <laughs> well, that's sweet, but I'm just here. I'm the health inspector, so I'm just coming by to <coughs> <laughs> I'm coming by to check up on your ice cream shop that I know the city loves so much. Uh, two scoops in one cup. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we named it after that that viral video of the girls dumping in a cup. Okay. Yeah, hey guys, uh, we're out of soap in the bathroom, so just I'm sorry. Use hot water. So I'm just gonna do an inspection. Um, look in the cap in your ba <laughs> the back in there and. <laughs> Yeah, well, help yourself, and if you change your mind, you want to scoop, you could just come back here and take it yourself, or I'll give a <laughs> flying fuck. This is a neighborhood-friendly store where we like people to help themselves. Oh my god, I, I have to pee. Yeah. Uh, oh, you could use the bathroom, we're, we're, we're running low on soap. Rick, I have to pee, I don't want, I, if you make me laugh more, I'll pee my pants. Just put the towel down. No. This I, is an ice cream shop where we encourage I'm peeing when you have to. Cut, cut the scene. Cut! Could you do that on Saturday Night Live? <laughs> if something's happening where you might have to pee, would you stand up and call cut? Visit patreon.com slash take your shoes off or click the link in the description. Now take your shoes off and enjoy the rest of the episode. Yeah, and, so he was like- And uh, I had no idea that was your- I'm sorry, keep going. Yeah, that yeah, was your no, intro. Yeah, it was like, because he was just standing out on the promenade, like handing out things. And uh, and what I- What year is this? 2004, 2004, yeah, 2005. And it was funny because I was handing out uh, free uh, tiramisu's because at the restaurant that I was working at, <laughs> it was like I, I wrote my initials on the card. And if somebody brought in my card, I got a buck. So, like, I was handing out these free tiramisu cards. Hey, Bravo Kachina, it's right down here, blah, blah, blah. And he was like, oh, you want to come to the comedy show? I was like, you want a free dessert? And uh, we traded cards. And I was like, can I really go for free? He goes, am and, I getting a tiramisu? <laughs> yeah, it was crazy. So, like, the first show I went to, like, Chris Rock came. It was at the Improv. Chris Rock came up at, when Dane came up, like the place exploded. Like I was seeing so much great comedy and I was like, man, I'm, 
I'm in the middle of all this. Like, yeah, I'm here by myself. Like this being LA this entertainment. Being, exactly. Because like up to that point, it was like I would get an audition like once a month. And I just didn't feel like I was in LA. I was like, oh, I'm waiting tables and I don't know. And then and then once I I kind of started meeting a few of the comics. I didn't really befriend them because I was like, oh, they're way out of my league. Like, I, mm. I, I didn't, I, they're, they're, they're already successful. And I, I, Do I, you look at them as successful because they're successful? Or is there also something to the fact that they're funny? There's a, they're funny. They have the crowd like roaring immediately. So you would have felt different if you met a group of like actors that were successful versus the comedians? Uh, I don't know. Uh, I think I probably would have felt the same. Somebody who had moved to LA and was proving that. It works. So and it's it's not that you were attracted to the funny. It was the people that you that you could be successful. Yeah, I, but both too because I had that I had that being around funny people gave me that sense of comfort, like what I had when I was younger. Mm. Um, and so I would go to the comedy clubs by myself. And Did you buy tickets? No, because Glebe like I, I got on a on an email list and it was like special guest, blah blah blah. And so I would go to I right. I mean I so don't, whenever he had a show. It wasn't even his, sometimes it wasn't even his show. I, I had I had I got on like the Comedy Juice, I think was Yeah, that like was the, he started Comedy Juice. Yeah, I was on their website or right. something and so I kept getting and I was like, Oh my gosh, like is Sarah Silverman's gonna be on? Yeah, I'm gonna see her. Um and yeah, I, I ended up meeting, you know, uh, I ended up meeting Chris and Chris was doing open mic and he was friends with a, a guy that uh, was friends with somebody that I knew from back home and and I was like he was one of the first comedians that I actually went up to because I was like, dude, you're so funny. Delia. Because Yeah. Because he wasn't, he was just, he was performing in front of like five people. And what year is this? 2014, 2015. No, sorry. Uh, 2004, 2004 2005. Yeah, that's what I meant. 2000. Yeah. Um, and so basically like he was like, yeah, you want to go to, you want to go to a coffee shop? And I'm like, yeah, sure. So we sat and we talked and we laughed and going back and forth. And then we lived in the same neighborhood. So he would come pick me up three or four nights a week. And I would just go, I mean, he would, go, he would do two or three spots a night and I would just go with him. Yeah. And he's like, what do you think about this? And we were talking about jokes and it was just so cool that he would, I saw his audiences like get bigger and bigger. And I'm like, yeah, yeah. The, and, did and you I feel felt, that you were part of it? Yeah. I really did. Do you feel that you weren't part of it now? Yeah. Uh, I met Chris in either 2008 or 2009 at the Haha ha Cafe. Uh-huh. Uh, I had been around L.A. for maybe a year at that point. Yeah. And I'm going to the comedy store. I'm seeing people way more famous than Chris. Yeah. When I saw him perform, I, I, I couldn't believe what I saw. Yeah. Um, outside of being, you know, at the time I'm doing stand-up, but outside of like before I got into stand-up and like, you know, you see... Seinfeld. I saw Seinfeld. I got to go. Were you getting up or were you just an audience member? I uh, I moved here in, in 2008 and I had been doing stand-up for a year and a half in Cleveland. But yeah. I also was doing improv and I wasn't doing stand-up regularly. Yeah. Um, it wasn't until I moved out. At th this point, I was still like doing shows, you know, one or two a month. Yeah. So I'm not really doing it yet. Right. Uh, but I'm around and I'm watching yep. and I'm at the comedy store and I'm seeing people yep. that this is so cool to see. Yep. But when I saw Chris perform, and and I had heard about him before, mm -hmm. I didn't know who he was. I didn't even know his name. I just knew he was a guy that looked like him, and he was tall, and mm -hmm. that's probably the guy that people told me about. Yeah, I, I, and I couldn't believe it. Yeah, it, it, I, it's I still believe that he's one of the funniest people in the world right. to ever have done that. Right. Uh, to, to ever do stand up, I mean. But it's different when you know somebody. Yeah. Because now I know him. Then yeah. I didn't. Yeah. But so much so that I never went up to anybody. And then after the haha, -ha, made me think because you said you went up to him. Yeah. After the haha, -ha, he was sitting outside or what doing, you know, he's yeah. with friends or something. And I walked by and uh, I went up to him. I am a fan, so I yeah. can't say I'm not a fan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I've been a fan of other people. I don't, I don't know. I don't, maybe I have, but I don't remember ever having the feeling of I'm a fan going up to a person yeah. and just being like, Hey man, you're really funny. Not making eye contact yeah, because yeah. I'm I'm so embarrassed <laughs> that I'm telling him I'm yeah, a fan. Yeah, yeah, he was yeah. that, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And that was he was still not famous yet. Yeah. Well, that's the same way I felt about all these other comedians. Like I wouldn't have said that to Chris if he was, you know, five years along. Like, right, more approachable. Yeah. I still got to say that there was something he was not. I don't know if that's you know it's a combination of me being nervous, the business, and also the energy Chris gives yeah, off. Yeah. But he was not very approachable. Yeah. Uh, uh, just as I mean, just his. 
I don't want to put that all on him because yeah. it just when somebody goes up and defies, you know, what stand up could be. Yeah. It's intimidating. Yeah. So. Yeah, that was that's the same reason why I didn't go up to Dane Cook. He was still hanging out at the improv bar and like people were going up and talking to him. But like, oh, I can't go like that's, Dan, you know. Yeah, but Dane always had crowds around, like people yeah, around him. Yeah, but sometimes, I mean, sometimes in, in the improv bar on like a seven o'clock show, like he'll just be sitting there and I'm like, oh my gosh, like I can go say something to him. Right. Like nobody's around him right now. I, so It's so, I'm not a famous comedian. Yeah. Um, thanks, David. Yeah. Uh, and I, I, I don't think this is directly analogous, but still sometimes when people come up to me and or me and my friends and say like, want to take pictures and stuff it feels so ridiculous not they're ridiculous it's like you guys know that we're just you know i, I live in a one bedroom right <laughs> like you know you know I've, i yeah. i literally do fart jokes for, yeah. to make my podcast work yeah um and though i do believe that's still part of it there's still something that i remember going up to people that were relatively less successful than me yeah at now and just <gasps> And uh, it's a really good feeling yeah. to be like, oh, I'm, I'm, uh, you know, I'm somebody is honestly, you know, it's not the biggest, but a fan of mine yeah. feels really, really yeah. good. Yeah. And you, you forget your, your span. You forget how many people you're touching and how many people you're, you're brightening their day or their, week or their year. Like you forget the impact you have on all these faceless strangers and then one of them comes up to you and like you saying yes and doing something goofy, like you forget that, oh my gosh, like this person just met you. Like they've been following you for three years and seeing your career do this and then your podcast and they feel like some, I don't know, like they're on your team. Yeah, people have said that, uh, uh, and I get it. People said, I'm glad I found you yeah. before you. Yeah. And it's like, yeah. I, I get that. Yeah. Some uh, people used to say, not just to me, I did receive this, which is very nice, but I've heard people say in general about, entertainers yeah that they say thank you thank you for like making me laugh or giving me an escape or whatever and though it's nice it always feels a bit um uh romantic for the sake for the sake of hyperbole yeah but uh, you don't know what you did for that person well I, here's here's a realization yeah. i had when <clears throat> quarantine started sorry hold on yeah <clears throat> me like like keen trying to get your your old uh friends from high school to come out but they're not hearing me cough uh guys <laughs> now <laughs> jason when quarantine <laughs> happened i i always love and need tv and movies yeah but when quarantine happened i need i relied on it in a new way where i truly needed it mm -hmm. we all did mm -hmm. um and me finding a new show and giving me you know two weeks to binge especially if there's multiple seasons and it gave me two weeks of mm -hmm. happiness and distraction I started to have a new appreciation of this idea, like, th like thank you for making mm -hmm. this for me, and it both makes me feel good. It also get makes me feel like I have a bigger responsibility because there's so much content out there. So I don't feel like people need me; they'll get something. But if I am, if they are taking an hour or two hours to watch me, mm -hmm. you know, I don't want to say save them because I I don't think I'm saving anybody. But I know for me, when I watch something and it it took me in for two hours afterwards thank you for making that thank you for, i'm glad i have this tv and yeah they have a new sense of of gratitude toward entertainment cool yeah anyway cool so will you say thank you like if you if you see julie louis dreyfus would you be like thank you like i don't know like, I, I i don't know no, I don't. I don't know only because that's that's not my vocabulary for it yeah. as much as i feel gratitude it's you would try to compete with her like with bits no, no. i i mean w when i uh i i've done this with multiple people but one of my closest friends now is lamorne before yeah. i ever met lamorne i saw him at a party yeah and i had just started watching new girl a few weeks before cool and cool. and i was getting to the point um where he became and he's talked about this on my podcast and other things he didn't think he was funny at the beginning and right. i don't think he wasn't funny but i don't think right. he shined at right. all right right there was a moment at a, at a wedding episode. I think it was episode season two, whatever it was. He had an unbelievable episode. And then after that, he was so funny. And within days, I had seen that wedding episode, had a new appreciation for him, and then saw a few more and be like, this guy's fucking incredible. Cool. I saw him at a party and I went up to him and uh, it was 
I was a fan. It yeah. was it wasn't me being cool or introducing. It was, dude. I I I've been watching New Girl. I you're one of the funniest people I've ever met. Or, excuse me, one of the funniest people in the world. I'm such a huge fan of yours, and I meant that then, and I still feel cool. that way. The point I'm making is, it was never hard for me to go to tell somebody how great I think they were. Yeah. Are. Yeah. Um. I I don't think though that it would be thank you for making New Girl. Right. That's, that's still right, a, right, right, I right. get it, but it right, would be that. Right, right, you know? right, right, right. Yeah, that makes sense. I more feel thank you to this art form. Yeah. That. Yeah. You know what I mean? Right, right, right. Uh, but we kind of went like this a little bit, and you were talking about you not identifying as a comedian, but yeah. loving that world and and yeah. wanting to be part of it. Yeah. Well, I mean, and and, and when I think of comedian, I think stand up comedian. I, 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 yeah, I'm a comedic actor. Um, well, I'm an actor. Like I, my first series regular job was on flaked a comedy mm -hmm. ironically. And it was like, well, I didn't get many comedy auditions before that. Like it was just, it was just kind of drama after drama after drama. And you would complain, I, not complain. Yeah, you, I did. You, yeah, I guess complain I did, about yeah, that to me. I did. I, and I, you would I, say that you that they need to see you be some, in something funny. Yeah, yeah, and 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 I was like open to like doing sketches and stuff, and even when we'll we cut did to a clip. So a few months ago, you two told us to raise our prices and to split Netflix into streaming and DVD. People hated it. And then the other day, you drafted an apology email uh, stating that he messed up and to divide Netflix into two companies uh, separately. The Quickster for the DVDs and the Netflix for the streaming. Now everybody hates us. So... So we're gonna need some more ideas. You're thinking too small, guys. What's better than two companies, dude? A shit ton of companies, dude. Flip the board. A different company for every movie. So every movie has its own website? Yep. Okay. Do you know how complicated that'll be? Different billing system, different login. So say you want to watch an Arnold Schwarzenegger action thriller where he loses his memory on Mars. Rick, what website should they go to? TotalRecall.netflix. What if I don't want to stream it? I want the actual DVD. Sure, you go to TotalRecallStir.netflix. $9.99 a month gets you unlimited Total Recalls. Keep the Total Recall as long as you want. Send it back in the mail. Get another Total, Total Recall! Guess what? John Candy's a lovable big city uncle. He has to go watch his brother's kids in the suburbs. What website, Rick? You can go to UncleBuck.Netflix, dude. I want to watch the gag reel after that movie. Gag reel dot big pancakes. Deleted scenes. Deleted scenes dot buck. Alternate endings. Buck dot fuck. Alternate endings streaming. Hulu.com. I'm listening. Guess what, guys? Whoopi Goldberg's making a sequel about a singing black nun in a church. Oh, then widescreen dot habit. You know what? No, she likes full screen. She's old school. City High dot Lauren Hills. How about an interview with that other black girl from the movie? Facebook.com. Yep. You know John Candy's making bloopers. How about Wander with Angelina Jolie? Boom dot buck. Are you gonna go to gag, gag reels dot uh... Helen Hunt and Bill Paxton chased around tornadoes in 1995. Twister stir. Newsflash, it's Christmas time. My grandma's had a heart attack. 25th anniversary special re-release of the film. 20th, fifth, what is it one more time? I want to see Adam Sandler in a 9-11 movie with Don Cheadle. 9-11 Don Cheadle. I now pronounce you Chuck and Larry dot Quickster. Billy Madison, Spanglish, Happy Gilmore. Uh, Saturday Night Live, early 90s. Okay, uh, enough with the URLs. Why is that Blockbuster sign in here? Uh, because, sir. You gotta be aware of what the competition's doing. And where did you get it? Where you get where everyone gets their marketing stuff. There's a guy. He's a marketing marketing guy. department. The marketing guy. He's a marketing guy. Mark from marketing. There's two companies. Well, there's Mark over at marketing, and, he and then is, there's Ting over at and Mark. He, but he only responds by mail. What is that? Oh, it's the next big thing, dude. Ever hear of mascots? Meet Netflix. Meet Quickster. I like it. We're back. Uh, it was a flickster. Anyway, Flix, uh, yeah. yeah, we're back. Um, so uh, yeah, I was I was trying to see if I really was funny because I was surrounded by all these funny people and I could I could kind of keep up. And I went to my managers and I was like, "Hey, I want to do funny stuff." And they were like, "Well, do you have?" Got it. 
And so I told her that uh, I wanted to go in for more comedies. And they actually happened to be producing Flaked. My management company was producing Flaked. And they sent me in for the wrong role. It was the role of the angry guy who had like the twirled up mustache and the hipster and everything. And at the time I'd had a beard and I shaved it all off and I, I twirled my mustache up in a curl. And I was just yelling, fucking this, fucking that, like all the, all this, the character stuff. And I walked out of the room and I thought that I had blown it because like here I was thinking that I was a funny guy, but then I went in for this role and there was nothing funny about it. And I went in angry and I left angry. A couple weeks went by and you went angry because you were mad or because that was the, the character, character getting the into. character. Yeah. Like he, the, they delivered the wrong sink and he was like in the scene, he's supposed to be doing all this. And I called my manager about a week and a half later and I was like, Hey, can you just call Sh Sherry Thomas and Sharon Bialy and kind of smooth it over? Just make sure they know that I'm a nice guy. Cause I was not a nice guy when I went in there. And they were like, oh, they actually want you to read for the lead of the show opposite Will Arnett. And I was like, oh, really? And they were like, yeah, they feel like you kind of have that energy. And I was like, oh, awesome. Why so, do you think they were able to see through the angry? I have no idea. That's a I have good cast, no idea. That's good, uh, the talent that's of a good, casting director? Yeah, she's, they're, they're great. I mean, that's why, that's why she's, they've been doing what they've been doing for so long. Um, and, yeah, they, they brought me back in for dinner. And I think I also kind of looked like the guy that Will kind of wrote it for. Um, mm. uh, he wrote it for his friend Dennis, which um, he's a great guy. Um, and I found out that when I was testing that I was actually testing against the actual Dennis. And I was like, yeah. oh, well, I'm never getting this. Um, and that's a completely different story. But uh, yeah, I ended up being on this funny show. And I was like, oh, yeah, well, now it should be easier for me to get in on like funnier stuff. Um, was but it? It, it, no, it, it wasn't really. Like I, I would I would go out for some like, uh, like guest stars, like some funny guest stars, um, every once in a while. Um, but yeah, I just, uh, I, I, it wasn't, I guess, I don't know. I, I never expected it to be easy, but I always kind of felt like, Oh, well, once I get that job, yeah. then the phone, the phone calls are going to start yeah, coming. You, you won Sundance. Yeah. And like you even said, you only got a few auditions. Yeah. Yeah. I'm like, Oh, I won Sundance. I'm a movie star now. Yeah. Like, give me, give me movies. And, it's hard. Mm -hmm. It's really, really hard. And I, yeah, I just, I kept doing what I was doing. I, I, I guess I had the faith that if I kept getting better and I kept, if I, and I stayed relevant and I stayed in the kind of, I don't know, atmosphere or in the, um, uh, the collective, I guess this is boring. Um, that, you know, I will eventually get, get, you know, consider for some of these bigger things. And then the guest stars started coming, and then one episode turns into two episodes, turns into five episodes, and then yeah, I I, I now get to go out for funny stuff and and dramatic stuff. I mean, the two things that are on right now are the Unicorn, which I ended up doing three episodes on, and the Wilds, which is on uh, Amazon, mm -hmm. uh, where I I'm a regular on that, and and I'm going back in a month to do another season. So you. It, uh, it, I mean, it's everything is so hard to get. Uh, yeah. But also, not only did your show film and you got paid for it, it got a second season. You're going to film it. I, 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 uh, I start filming allegedly in in March. Mm -hmm. But fuck, man, I audition for my show when I'm 34, and it's not going to come out until I'm 37. And wow. you auditioned for that show after I booked mine. Yeah. And you're going to start filming the second, second season before season. we even start filming the first. Wow. Uh, wow, <laughs> that's take right. so long. Yeah. And I've been obviously on hold. But Rick, for years. this show, I mean, this show is going to be, well, who, I think who it's. Knows? I well, There's a great chance. There's just, a great chance that they don't even film it. I mean, there's a better chance than not that they will, but I just, I still have this I'll believe it when I see it attitude. But I, when people see what you're going to do on this show. Maybe. Like, I, I was lucky enough to see him do it for the first time because we worked on his audition together. Um, yeah, also we didn't say David, my acting coach, yeah. coached me for, uh, I think, almost every role I've booked, yeah. including Undateable and yeah. this. Yeah, it was, uh, and and so when I, when I say that Rick is extremely present, like, that's so hard to be as an actor. Because you're not really taught how to do that in acting school. Not that I would know because I didn't go to acting school, but all the people that I teach and coach, that's the first thing that I, they're not listening. They're so focused on performing and they're so focused on getting their line right. And they're so focused on, on doing what they think they should Each do. Each other sentences. 
close. Um, that they're just not present, and 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 you can see it. I feel that all you need to be a lot of things to be great, including having the luxury of having external forces work for you: the script, the direction, the lighting, the mixing, the story, blah 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 yeah. blah. But when in doubt, you could at least be engaging. Yeah. If you're nothing but yeah. present. Yeah. And. And that's how what I feel about stand up. It's why I find it to be sometimes such an obstacle, because uh, most people, probably not for the wrong, think that the number one rule of stand up comedy is being funny. Sure. And I, I, and I've said this on the podcast, and not this way, but though I feel being funny is necessity. Yeah. It is not the the, the first thing you need to be. You need to be believable, and by believable I mean present. I mean. We need to believe that you, the performer, believe what you're doing sure. and you're there with it. Sure. And for the same obstacles that I had before, what I talked to you about, once you burn your tongue, you can't not feel it. If I'm not present, there is nothing I could do. You could memorize the words. You could, you could, somebody could tell you, we can't tell. We're not in your head. We don't know what you're thinking, but I'll never believe that. You could watch a performer and when you see their eyes, no. Not what they're thinking, but if they're thinking mm -hmm. and if their actions are honestly guided from their thoughts. I really believe it's subconsciously at the least the audience kn b knows that. Yeah. And if I cannot be present on stage, uh, I, and that's why, why it's so hard to repeat material, because when I'm repeating material, I'm just going through it. And I found blah, 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 blah. I found ways and cheats and in and out. But so ba back to podcasting and everything else when you can't be present you can't I, I you can't do anything yeah and what i'm very excited about go, you go can't do it and be good i think there then are why a lot do of, it well because there's a significant amount of money if you get to where you're really good at it i mean there are a lot of there are a lot of stand-up comedians who aren't present there are a lot of actors who aren't present they've gotten that are that are very good i wouldn't say very good but very well paid there there's a lot of mediocre acting but on they TV. can't control but yeah, but but then they got. I mean, we're all lucky if we get to do it. Sure. But then they got extra lucky. Sure. Because they have other things. They look a certain way. They know a certain person. They're consistent. Like you can be right. consistently mediocre, but they're consistent. Like they're not going to have amazing moments because they're just not that type of performer. But yeah. they're consistent, and they know they know what the the, the the storytellers know what they can get out of that person. Yeah, and I guess that is a skill set. Yeah. Um, I don't have that. Yeah. And. Uh, I don't either. I, I don't remember. Either. I remember from the Netflix thing that we showed that that the ops, how how upset you were. I guess on surface, if you felt you weren't going to be funny, yeah. But it was mostly because you were just questioning so many things, and you couldn't. You felt like you couldn't just do it. Yeah. Um, and I remember there was one, at least one, but I remember there was one take that you had it and you stopped. Uh huh. Uh, and you've told me this during auditions, uh -huh. like. Never stop. We could always not use it, but yeah. you you don't know how yeah. it's looking. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I feel that you know I want to direct. That's that's one of the big things. Yeah. That's a big goal of mine. Yeah. And I feel that as a director, what my skill set would be is uh, getting the performance, for better or worse, getting the performance that I want out of people mm -hmm. and finding ways of doing that. Mm -hmm. um, I'm very excited about that type of opportunity. You're really good at it. Thank you. Yeah. When I can't do that for the other person and or me, there's a. That's when I spin. Mm. Have you run into that? On the podcast. Yeah. Mm. Um, that's different, though. It's the same. Di no, because you. Uh, I mean, you can't it's tell. The same skill set. Yeah, I guess so. But getting something that you want out of the other person is different when you're directing a sketch or a TV show. Yeah, you know what? You're 100% right. It yeah. doesn't... Uh, but I, you're right. But I don't treat it that way. And I think I'm wrong for that. That's actually a great observation. Yeah. I can't try and control you. Right. I shouldn't try and control no. you. But there are moments when the podcast is not going away that I feel is interesting or engaging mm -hmm. so i add that responsibility and also so, sometimes I'm, I'm wrong and i'm just getting in the way of the other person but mm. i don't know i guess that's the craft of hosting mm. 
much. Okay. Uh, how are you feeling? Good. Are you? Mm -hmm. How do you think this is going? Um, <clears throat> I think it's going good. I, 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 I don't think that it's going to be very well received by your audience um, because I'm just, I'm, I'm not very exciting. <laughs> Um, what a bummer, man. But I, I think I know. Um, what do you think uh, I'm saying is a bummer? I know, a bummer that I think that. No, that I have you here and you're just not an exciting guy. <laughs> I'm just yeah. joking. I know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Does yeah. that feel condescending when I say I'm just joking? Or uh, is that nice to hear? I don't think you needed to say it. Okay. Yeah. Um, I knew it. Um, yeah. No, I just... Uh, I feel like it's good and I feel like people are going to get something from it, but also it's kind of going against what it is that we're both really good at. And that's being present. Like if we're focused on the result and if we're focused on something that's beyond our control, it's going to take away from the magic and the chemistry we have right here. So when you say, how is this going? Like I'm enjoying this. I'm engaged. I'm with, I think, I think, I think you sound really smart. I think I sound really smart. I think I look really handsome um, as always. Um, but I, I, I can't get, focused on how are people going to think yeah that's a know? question i shouldn't i shouldn't ask that i do have I, i've gotten comments from people saying uh we you, you don't need to check in with how it's going i definitely why? do it less why do they send those comments no why, why do i do it no why is that not okay to do you don't have to you don't have to i think because i think because i do it often well it just shows that you care about your guest and and who knows like if, if this person isn't feeling so great that's why I, it I, may just help them breathe a little bit easier that's my just, my intention is yeah. to to try and be on the same page as the other person, but it might yeah. take them out of it. I'm, I'm curious how much you uh, base your structure on what your fans say. Not because, much. Okay, good. Maybe, maybe I should more. I don't know if that's the really? case. I don't know, but I do think there is something to, if enough people say stuff, and those people are people who see enough of me. Are these DMs or because there's also comments, be bandwagon? DM, comments, DMs. And a lot of times it is when people say stuff that, as I was saying before, it's when people mention stuff about where it matches up with things I was already questioning. Mm -hmm. Like if somebody says something and it's like, I was feeling that, it, it's worth exploring more. Mm -hmm. um, and I'd be foolish to not at least consider a common observation or sure. reaction to the podcast. Sure. It doesn't mean I'm going to sure. take it into consideration. Yeah. But I do think at a certain point, there are things to learn that could be tools. Um, one is, uh, and I don't, I, and these by tools or rules, it doesn't mean you can't break them, but they're worth considering. And one is, and I've talked about this on the podcast, Steve Martin says in his book, never let the audience know you're bombing. Mm -hmm. And, there's a there's an instinct and sometimes a good one where you want to acknowledge when you fail, mm -hmm. but also sometimes the audience might not think you're failing, mm -hmm. and it becomes self fulfilling. Yep. So, knowing that, I have since taken a more intentional approach in when I let the audience in on what ever. I don't. Oh, here's a great thing I learned late in life. Um, I don't. I don't owe everybody my truth. And by not giving them my truth, it doesn't mean the alternative is lying. It just means I don't have to walk outside naked. It's okay that I'm wearing layers. Mm -hmm. I don't have to pretend I'm not wearing layers. Mm -hmm. But there's a safety that I feel in just confessing and admitting because I'm so uncomfortable lying and I'm so uncomfortable being misunderstood, as I'm sure a lot of people could relate to, that it's a lot easier just to be present and just say, I'm not sure how this is going. And sometimes that could be charming and could help connect. Mm -hmm. But sometimes it's an excuse to put my insecurities onto the conversation or to the other person. Mm -hmm. And I think that that could be counterintuitive sometimes. Hmm. But uh, you have control of the edit. Doesn't matter. The, ed the, edit, the edit is me. Because as if it makes somebody feel better. If. Yeah. But there's a chance it could derail the conversation into a seven minute whatever this is <laughs> where it's like it's like yeah. it's like having an instinct on stage you know doing it long enough sometimes as a heckler and you learn both how to acknowledge and when to even acknowledge sure and sometimes even though i think i could get a laugh and or keep my my dominance of the room by acknowledging this it's not going to be worth it because you're opening the door to more yeah and i have to know i want to say this but i know it's better for the long run not to mm. 
it's that art form of doing that mm. and being able to do that in your head while continuing this. Mm. I would be curious how you, once you start going live, how different it's going to be. I want to uh, hear why, but I have to go pee. Go ahead. I, th I think this podcast has something to offer both of us, which is uh, a foire into you experiencing podcasting and podcasting on this, on Take Your Shoes Off. And also me, with the headspace I've been in, I've been a little bit more in my head and in the mindset of the stuff we've been talking about. And I would love if you're up for it and no decision to make now, we do another one at some point, but I uh, mean, after doing this, I obviously feel better. So yeah, for sure. Was there expectations that were different or met that make you feel that way? Uh, no, I think it's just a level of comfort and knowing that I'm actually in control of what I say. Like, I guess I thought that I would get caught off guard and that I would have to say something that I didn't, necessarily sentences feel like i wanted to say each other sentences I, there's a couple of things that i could think of uh, yeah but then again at the end of the day like oh well if you don't want to talk about that don't talk about it you know so if, if you if, do if i talked about stuff that you didn't feel comfortable talking about would d d before did you feel that you would feel f obligated and you or you wouldn't be able to say i'd rather not yeah because then like well why are you even on here yeah there's if also you, you some, there's also something to telling people I don't want to talk about it that that feels maybe that you're presenting a weakness. Does yeah. that make sense? Not sure. you, like sure, 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 yeah. The psychology of it. Yeah, I yeah. think it's, uh, but I, I think it's more of a strength to be able to put yeah. up a boundary like that. Yeah, that's true. Uh, that's true. You were an Argo, mm -hmm. and you worked with Ben Affleck. Yeah, is there a difference in working with somebody like that? Specifically in this insecurity of wanting to prove your worth, uh, how would you compare that to wanting to do well on this big thing versus your first comedy role on Flaked where you want to prove that you're funny? What are the similarities and differences? Does that question make sense? It does. I wish I had a better answer. Um, no, there wasn't a difference. It was basically like I have a story to tell. Um, and I need to figure out the best way to tell this story. And if what I'm doing isn't working, then they're going to tell me. And they, it's the director? The, yeah, the director, the producer, whoever, the writers. And they've already chosen me. Like, I'm chosen. Like, they've chosen me to do this job. Like, this huge movie, I didn't know it was going to win an Oscar, but like, or multiple Oscars, but it was just another audition for me. And I did it. They called me back. I had more lines. The casting director was like, well, you know, Ben kind of saw you more as this role. And I'm like, oh, cool, Ben. Um, and then I got chosen. And I'm like, oh, cool. They like what I did. They, 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 they see me as a piece to this puzzle that's going to fit. So when, I, when it's time for me to go to set, I'm ready. And I'm, I have an idea of, of how the scene's going to go. And then as soon as I get there, it all changes. <laughs> like for Argo... It was supposed to be two scenes, and uh, it ended up being a long walk and talk, and uh, we ended up changing some of the lines. Ben like pulled me aside, had a conversation with me. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I don't think it was any different. I, I, I think just I want to do well, as anybody does. And do you, do you feel, uh, relatively speaking, Argo mm -hmm. is a bigger thing yeah. than, at the time, a a comedy show on Netflix. Yeah. I don't mean it's better, or, know but you mean. know what I mean? It's just yeah. like, there's more eyes on it. Yeah. Uh, do you feel that you belong in the moment? Did you feel there was a place where you belonged and you were ready for more than the other one? Cause the impression I got for you was that you felt like Argo, I belong and a comedy. You don't, you would think that I would feel more that sense of belonging as I grow in my career. And, looking at my resume like oh yeah well yeah of course he's this but inside it's like man am am i actually good enough to be doing this like and then i have to go back and watch a tape and be like oh yeah i am good enough is there a particular tape no i just go to my computer and i scroll up and there's i mean there's just auditions where i'm like man i crushed that 
and I've gotten so much better. Or like, man, I didn't think that was a good tape. And like, oh, that actually was pretty good. So I, I'll go back and I'll watch old tapes just to make me feel better. Like I am growing and I am getting better. I'm not answering your question. Um, where Where is the two... Where is the guy that says they picked me? Yeah, and and they know, and and I, I I'm a puzzle piece that fits. Yeah, versus the other side that is questioning it. Well, that is what I'm telling myself, and that's what I have to tell myself in order to feel like on the day when I'm in my trailer and they're going to call me anytime that I'm the man. I am good at this. I know what I'm doing. They've picked me for a reason. But on the inside, I'm just like, ah, oh, I hope I don't mess this up. Like that's I the hope- kid. I uh, that's the kid. Yeah, yeah, that's the kid. That's what I'm saying. They're always there. Yeah, but by the time I walked out and and by the time they knocked on the door, I'm I go back into like hell yeah. Yeah. Like this is it. This is time. And and when it all changed, the little kids started saying, "Oh no, now what are you going to do? They're not going to cut. You have to do this thing as a walk and talk." But then I'm like, "Yo kid, I got this." Because you've done it enough. At that point I hadn't. At that point I hadn't done it enough, but I had to acknowledge the scared little kid and say, yeah, I know why you're scared, but you're here for a reason. And that reason is is because you're pretty special. Like, they auditioned thousands of people. This is a huge studio movie, and they picked you. Yeah, I don't know, but what if they, you know, once once we're actually walking and talking, they, they'll cut. They'll cut. They'll make it work. Like, that's that's no longer, like, that's on them. And it was it was a little scary to me when, when like, we did it a couple times and then Ben would cut and come over and talk to me. I'm like, oh man, am I messing this up? I want to make sure people know. I don't remember if we established that we're talking about Ben Affleck. Oh, Ben Affleck. Yeah. Um, uh, and he, it was his producing partner who I think at the time may have been his assistant or something, but she was like, he wouldn't waste the time talking to you if he didn't like what, what you were doing. He's like, he just wants, he wants something different. And as he was talking to me, the, it, the scene started changing. And I remember him saying to me, I, I, my line was, um, uh, my line was like, to hell with it. That was one of my lines, to hell with it. And he was like, what do you feel like you'd say here? He's like, I, I feel like there's just like, there's something here and, and we, we might need to, to switch it up a little bit. And I said, I just say, fuck them. And he's like, let's get one with you saying, fuck them. We're talking about like the people uh, who have like kidnapped. And I'm like, like, get a take with me saying that? And he's like, yeah. And I'm like, okay. And so we did a take where we do the whole walk and talk. Blah, blah, we get into the office and then finally I just say, you know, fuck them. And... And he was like, that was great. Cut. That was so loud. Um, but then, then we moved on. It was like him being an actor, like he knew that I was like giving him. And the scene wasn't about me by any means. But like he knew that he was seeing something that he liked. He just wanted to, to craft it a little bit and, and, and make it, I don't know, make it have, hold a little bit more weight. And it made me, at the beginning, it made me feel really bad. Like I was screwing up. Oh, I'm messing this up. My first big studio movie, like all these people. Oh my gosh. And then like when she said that in the chair, I was like, oh yeah. And it caused my perspective to shift a little Mm -hmm. bit. And then when we got it, you know, when we did like little fist, I'm like, oh, cool. Doesn't it make you feel so much better when you feel like you're collaborating as opposed to just being a pawn yeah. even though we, we are pawns in most of the things yeah. we do yeah but it's 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 perspective though mm-hmm. because sometimes you won't have that conversation and you need to give yourself that different perspective you need to be like hey no wait no this is yeah we're we're working together on this thing like yeah. you know my mind talk about the little kid it'll often go to man don't mess this up you, you got to be good here you got to be really funny here don't forget that joke don't forget when you you punched it and then i'm like ah I think there's something to you having experienced these moments that make you feel a certain way mm-hmm. and also finding ways to talk to yourself. Mm-hmm. The, the way you're, you're, I mean, maybe the literal words, but the way like you're, you're role playing, talking to yourself right now yeah. is the same way you talk to me yeah, uh, and the same way you talk to your son. Yeah. And I think there's there's definitely a correlation into either you getting over your obstacles or you being a good dad, yeah, which are kind of the same thing that yeah. you're able to talk to a kid. Yeah, uh, I've said this to you numerous times, and I don't know how much you want to get into, but as humans do, um, and let me know if this if I'm crossing. Do you mind if I talk about you as a dad at all? No. Um, you have been in situations with me where you where you question your, am I doing this right? Yeah. Am I am I a good you know and and it's 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 wild like you're one of the best dads to me 
and I've seen how you are with <laughs> but your empathy that you have for other people is uh, it's really fortunate that you're able to have that for yourself too mm. do you think of that as a strength do you know what I'm talking about you were just talking to the kid in you yeah. the same way I hear you talk to in the same way you talk to me yeah I don't I probably don't do it enough uh, or the other voice is louder. The kid voice? Like, no, the other voice being like, you know, hey, don't, don't fuck this up. As opposed to like, I sometimes have to hear that voice, acknowledge that voice, stop that voice, and then remember, hey, come on, bud. I don't do that enough. Do you I think don't... it's easier to be nicer to other people than yourself? Cor yes, 100%. Yeah. Because I... Yeah, I think, you know, being an athlete, you're often yelled at and you're often all the mistakes are pointed out, you know, like you, you, you know, when you whenever, whenever you score the touchdown, everybody, you know, cheers for five minutes, but or a couple minutes, but then you got to go out and kick off and then you got to go make the tackle and then you got to get back on defense. So I, yeah, I don't know. I, uh, uh, it's. It's hard for me to receive adulation. It's hard for me to receive that from other people. Is that what you asked me? No. I bet I guess that's connected. You, it, it, being nice to yourself or even other people being nice to you, it's hard. Yeah. Because yeah. you're not oh, worthy. Oh, 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 what I was saying. Oh, the voice is like I, I, I responded as an athlete to people yelling at me, telling me what to do, telling me how to do it. And so I talked to myself like that for a really long time. And it wasn't like, you know, in come a, on, man. In a motivating way or in a mean way? In a mean way. In a mean way. And, you know, I, I, I didn't get into therapy until I was in L.A. for probably 10 years. Like, I thought if you went to therapy, you were weak. And I was like, that what? I'm not doing that. And it, and it wasn't until I didn't go to therapy. I was teaching and um, I was talking to the, the one of the other teachers. And I was like, I don't know why people listen to me. Like, I... All these people went to drama school and got masters. Listen to you, you mean the people that as you're a teacher? Teaching. Yeah, I'm like I'm just I'm just like them, but like they have a master's degree. I, who am I? Right. Um, and he was just like, well, what does your therapist say about that? And I'm like, I don't I don't go to therapy. I don't know what you're talking about. And well, what so, does your therapist say about that now? Uh, well, I haven't been in therapy in a while, but uh, well, <laughs> <laughs> therapist walks out. Uh, uh, um, yeah, I, I, I think I w she taught me to speak to myself the way that I would speak to my son, mm -hmm. um, because I didn't necessarily have that when I was younger. I, 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 I think I did, but I, I must not have, like I, when I think about my parents, like I, I think of all the, about them being kind and nurturing, but for some reason I feel like I'm, I miss I miss that. Um, I don't know. My mom, like, I think I was a freshman or a sophomore in high school when she took a job in Kansas City, and she left. And my dad w had a full-time job, and and we stayed. Uh, and my dad was working, and I was going to practice after school. So there was a lot of, like, I kind of had to, when I say this as a freshman in high school, like, I kind of had to grow up on my own. Um, and I, I guess... Are your brothers old? Did they already move out? Yeah, yeah. My brother, my brother's four years older, and then my sister, who you didn't know that I had one, is four years older than than him. Yeah, I um, didn't know you had a sister until what, maybe a month ago. Yeah, um, uh, uh, I just, I, yeah, I just, I guess, I guess I never talked about her. Um, uh, but yeah, I, I based a lot of my decisions and a lot of my um, uh, work ethic and and. Um, I don't know, I guess how I lived my life was based on what other people expected me to be or what other people expected me to do. And in being a, a good athlete and being like a nice, kind person and do treat other people the way you want to be treated, there was a high level. And so I just put a lot there's of pressure. There's a high level. There's a high level. Uh, there's, a, there's a big expectation of always being kind. And always being good and, and working harder than everybody and else. And what you're saying by, by being that you were validated, that it's a... 
I was validated, but I, I, I never really talked to myself very kindly. I, I mean, I guess, I guess it was more motivating. Like, come on, you got this. Um, but then when I would mess up, I would be real hard on myself. And I guess I'm quick to point it out to other people because like, if you start being hard on yourself, I'm like, Hey, 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 because I'm so, I'm so sensitive to it. So you want that you talk to yeah. people quite literally. The, I mean, that's, yeah. 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 When you say you treat people or talk to people where you want to be treated, even though it makes sense, that saying, yeah. not just when you say it, th that like kind of puts a real literal, yeah. like you are literally giving people the thing that you want. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Are you get, are you good at it yet? Now that you know that talking to myself yeah. like that? No. Um, I like to think that I'm okay at it, but a lot of the time I'm not, I'm not good at it till kind of the end of the day. Like I was mean to myself on the golf course today and I, yeah, I'm pretty mean to myself a lot, but then at the end of the day, I check in, well, not, th not at the end of every day, unless something's like really weighing on me. I kind of just let it go. But yeah, I'm not that I'm not as nice to myself as I am to other people. If there's ever anything, if I'm ever going somewhere and I want a friend to go, uh, I know there's always David, not just because <laughs> yeah. I enjoy your company, but yeah. you don't say no. You no. almost live like, yes, man. Yeah. What do you think it is in you that makes you? I mean, you could call David day of and say, you want to go to Vegas? And you said, where are we staying? I'm in. Yeah. I, I remember when I started dating uh, uh, Tori a long time ago. Yeah. And it was Christmas. Yeah. And she, I was going to go there with her sister and her mom. And mm -hmm. I, we were new. And, and you said, I told you I was going. You said, what time are we going? Yeah. You just feel invited already. <laughs> yeah. Which is such a nice thing for me on the receiving end you yeah. know i i guess some people would be like i don't want to feel like i'm inviting myself yeah uh well at the same time which you say yeah you've told me well at the same time you literally I, i'm going home to cleveland for thanksgiving uh great uh, uh <laughs> where am i staying am i staying and you're being silly but you mean yeah. it yeah 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 how, how is somebody like you who who invites themselves to a new girlfriend's house when i haven't even met her mom yet yeah. and you yeah. want to come yeah versus that other feeling that you have where I don't want to invite myself over and, and you feel like maybe you don't have the most friends in Los Angeles because yeah. you feel like you're intruding. Yeah. Where did the, those two sides differ? I, I think the comfort level of, of the person. Like, I don't think I would do that with anybody, maybe one or two other people. Like, I, I, don't, I wouldn't do that with just anybody. I feel really comfortable with you. And, and I just feel like we're going to have a good time, whatever we do. Like... If you're going to be nervous about meeting a parent, even though I wasn't invited, and even though you didn't express that you were going to be nervous at all, I was just like, how fun would that be? I don't remember if I was nervous. I'm yeah, sure it, I wasn't. I'm sure it was you okay. Weren't, you weren't. But it was like, I, I've, I've done it in the past, and we've had an amazing time. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, let's do that again. Yeah, so it's uh, uh, it's just something that I... I like the unexpected, I guess. I like, like we talked about earlier, I like being present. And, and if you say, hey, we're going to go do this or I'm going to go do this and I'm, 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 I'm not sure quite what I'm going to do. I just know that I'm going to go. I'll be like, yeah, I'll go. I'm in. Just because like there's no expectations. Like you, when, I can't. Uh, when are there expectations? Uh, when I have to host or when, I, like when's the last time you came to my apartment? Like that's nothing on you. It's on me because like, I don't invite you over. Like, I would rather I, come to your apartment than you come to mine because of the way I have OCD in my apartment. Really? Yeah. But if I invited you over, you wouldn't come. It depends. Mm. That's my own obstacles of leaving the house. Yeah. But I'm still... I, I, I am more comfortable but with you hosting me than with me hosting mm, you. I don't know about that. I think we. I think we have a better time, and maybe that's my own... I think we have a better time whenever I'm here with you because 
if you were if you came over to my house then i would feel this pressure of hosting i would feel this pressure of like well i know i'm only gonna have rick for like 20 or 30 minutes because he's gonna feel uncomfortable and like he's because gonna, of who i am and i'm uncomfortable with so many things a, a little bit of who you are but also with me like i'm not a great host i'm not a great planner i i don't do a i don't do fun things on my own like i i do fun things with other people like i don't I mean, I went and played golf today because somebody invited me. Mm -hmm. Like, I, I, I had my golf clubs in L.A. for 15 years. For 15 years. I had my golf clubs in L.A. 15 years ago. I didn't play golf until a decade later. And then, and then three or four more years go by, and then I played again. I, I just started playing again recently. But, yeah, I don't – I'm not that fun. I'm, I'm fun around you because you're a fun person. And I'm fun – and I'm fun around like all my other comedians because they're fun people. Who's fun around not fun people? I was kicked out of a poker game because I was not that I wasn't fun, but everybody else was so boring that it made me look annoying. <laughs> yeah, but also, I mean, there's certain etiquette. There's certain etiquette yeah. that you're not aware of. And the, in that poker game. Yeah. Those people. I would say any poker game. People, and maybe I'm overcompensating, people <laughs> love playing with me. For real money? Yeah. Uh. I don't know. I grew up playing poker with, with my friends. I mean, Rounders came out when I'm in like ninth grade or so. Right. So I don't know if you remember, at least in our world, poker rounders. became yeah. everyone. Of course. And I was, I was always, I remember that there was a, this uh, casino night that, that the prices put on and it was like, it was cool. Like they actually had like roulette table. They did like sure, a real sure, thing. Yeah. And uh, they were making jokes, but they made that joke only with me. Yes, Mr. Glassman, when I would come in, they would treat it like they're, they would bring me, uh, what would you like to drink? Only it was me. It was always Dr. Pepper with a straw. Uh -huh. They would treat it like I'm a high roller, uh -huh. not because I was, but because they enjoyed my, I, I remember I felt I'm so wanted here because I am the way I am. And I got lucky that they liked that thing. Were they parents? No. The prices weren't parents? prices. Well, the prices were the parents and the kids. It was David, Zach, and Robbie. Price were the kids. But the, who put together the casino? The kids. Night? Oh, the kids did. Yeah. Okay. So it was all like high school kids okay. from my age and above. Right. A, a couple that were above, which yeah. worked in my favor because yeah. they didn't already know me as the thing that wasn't really accepted. So uh -huh. when the older kids meet me for the first time, it worked. I guess. Yeah. Uh, I was very well received, and they, people wanted me there. Were you taking their money? Uh, I don't remember. I, well, I, I just I'm saying it's different when people have their own money on the line, and when you call somebody a bitch to their face because they won't call you, and like you don't know that person as well as you knew the prices. Do you know what I mean? Like I, I've played well, poker the, with the, you. The a reason I time. kicked out of this poker game wasn't calling people a bitch. That was probably one of the factors. There was there was it was shit talking and it wasn't particularly a bitch. <laughs> right. Uh, I just want to make iron that out because I did get in trouble for calling somebody a bitch before. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, but. Yeah, they didn't like it. Yeah. And let me tell you something. Uh-huh. I didn't like playing with them. Uh-huh. It's dreadfully boring. Yeah. So, as a competitive person, instead of just like sitting there quiet while they're like counting their odds, yeah. I go, oh, you, you stare, you're, you know, just just cliche. Sure. Uh, you know, I don't want to, you know. Sure. You chicken. Yeah. Or you, you know. Yeah, or right, right, right. Whatever it was to, yes, maybe calling them a bitch. Yeah. But like I'm getting competitive. It's fun. They didn't like it. No. So I'm not invited anymore. Right. And let me tell you something. At the end of the day, those people are boring. <laughs> so I, you, when you're around people that are not boring, you feel, when you're around people that aren't fun or exciting, you feel that you're blank, mm -hmm. boring, introverted, mm -hmm. not sure, interesting. Sure. Whatever the thing is, a negative. Sure. I am also could be perceived as a negative, yeah. but like mean or you yeah, know, yeah, yeah. Com too competitive or whatever it might yeah. be. But the truth is, that's because they suck. Yeah. But that's their game. Yeah. Like, it's, it's their game, and, and you're, their, you're a guest. Yeah. And so if you want to play in that game, there's a certain type of etiquette. I don't want to play in that game. Great. Then that's the thing. Hey. Go, go and play a time or two and be like, you know what? This isn't for me. But do you know why I didn't want to play in that game before I got kicked out? Because they were boring. Because they're boring. Right. And I talked about this a little bit because I found out at that moment a month or so ago with Eric Griffin when he was here. Yeah. A friend of mine who runs that poker game called me up to tell me about a story of I've heard a few throughout the past couple of years. But this one in particular was he's out with one of the guys from the poker game. Some of the people in the poker game loved having me. They said, I, I, wh why aren't you back? Mm -hmm. Or I hate that, that, I, that mm -hmm. you're so funny. And then yeah. a lot of them, maybe half. Yeah. 
said, you know, otherwise. Yeah. Uh, and my friend who runs the poker game, who was in a tough spot when he had to tell me, I don't know what to do. And I said, it was easy for me to say, don't worry about it. Mm-hmm. Um, said that they were out and we're talking to rant, uh, other people and sure. podcasts. And this guy said, you know, whose podcast is the, it's the best podcast out there is. And he mentions mine. And my friend calls him out and says, wait a minute, I'm confused. And he goes, yeah, you know what? Uh, I didn't know him, and it seemed like he was trying to do X, Y, Z. And after watching enough, I realized that's who he really is, and I, I, I like it. Yeah. Hey, guy. Well, maybe y- give me the benefit of the doubt. Yeah, yeah. Well, that that I think is one of your biggest strengths: the fact that you treat everybody the same, and the fact that like maybe you're irreverent, or maybe what does you irreverent mean? Th- there's no reverence. There's no uh, there's oh. no decorum. There's no like understanding of like, oh, I should probably be a little bit quieter if right. this is my first time to play with these people. But like, you're like, well, no, I'm going to have a good time because if I'm having a good time, then hopefully everybody else is having a good time. I'm going to be my best of when course. I'm having a good time. Of course, of course. And so you're assuming, well, if I'm having a good time and I'm cracking these jokes, then like, yeah, they're going to be in on it too. But these people are like, wait, I don't know you. You don't know me well enough to say that to me. Like there are people. Hey, what do I need? I need a password. But that's the thing. Like you don't know that person. So maybe you need to ask or but maybe you know how I'll get to know that person if they by, show him to me. Yes. But that's, that's what I'm saying. Like that, that irreverence, that, that unwillingness to kind of be something other than you're not can turn people off. I know, but it can also really turn people on when it's your crowd. I think that friendship is no different than dating. There could be a great girl out there who's beautiful, but we're just not compatible. Sure. But I should still, I, I talk about on stage it, 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 with a lot of examples, but one of which is about this idea of opening the car door for a girl. Yeah, we talked about that. And yeah. I'll do that because, you know, you're supposed to do yeah. that. But also, manipulative. it's manipulative. Yeah. And I'm also trying to show you, and I, I was dating, when I was dating, mm-hmm. uh, uh, we had a, it wasn't an argument, but it was more than a, it was a debate. Yeah. Yeah. Um, do you, do you already know the yeah, conversation yeah, we're having? Yeah, yeah, I'm yeah. still going to bring it up. Yeah, yeah. Which is, she uh, didn't drive mm-hmm. and wanted me to drive her home. And I would always pick her up and drive her home, and that's totally fine. Mm-hmm. Also, it is worth noting, this girl, uh, not that it matters, but it's she has a lot of money, and Ubers aren't an issue. Uber yeah. blacks aren't an issue. Right. A private driver wouldn't be an issue. Right. Okay? But that's still, it's my pleasure. There was a particular time where we were we were out and we were leaving and we could we usually went back to my place. Mm-hmm. So we either go to my place or her place. Mm-hmm. And I said, "Hey, uh, if we're going to go back to my place, uh, let I'll, let's go back to my place if you want to sleep over. But if you don't, I'd rather not have to drive you home because she would leave at 2 in the morning a lot. Right. Uh, and I would always drive her home at 2 in the morning. Yeah. But I'm saying, I would rather not drive you home just knowing me. So let's either go back to let's go back to your place or just, you know, call it a night." And she uh, was upset that I wasn't going to drive her home. Mm-hmm. And I, I always drive you home. Mm-hmm. I don't... Listen, it's your choice to not drive. Mm-hmm. I don't want to drive you... I don't want to have to leave it to in the morning tonight. And she goes, yeah, but, but it's just the, the, the right thing to do. Mm. And I remember thinking, how is it the right thing to do? And she said, because I want you to care if I'm safe. And I go, I, I, oh, I must have, didn't realize that. I never thought there was an issue. I always, never thought you didn't feel safe. Right. I guess that makes, do you not feel safe? She goes, no, I, I feel safe because she Ubers everywhere. That's what she does. Right. She, no, I feel safe. I just want you to make sure I feel, I'm like, but I do think you're safe. Mm-hmm. And you think you're safe. She's like, yeah, but when you, this is earlier on in our relationship, sure. a few months in. Sure. And she said, uh, I, uh. Yeah, but it's something you're supposed to do. It's just like a gentleman. I go, so if let's say we're dating now for three years and we live at different places, I'm just going to become your driver? And she said, no, uh, you don't always have to do it, but you should be doing it at the beginning in the courting phase. And that's what I thought was so odd. So I'm like, so you want me to pretend that this is who I'm going to be, but a year from now, I don't have to be that anymore? And it's not that deep, This, but it was a, a low stakes version of this same idea, which is, she wanted me to prove to her mm-hmm. that um, I could do something, but once I prove it to her, she doesn't need it anymore. Mm-hmm. And, and I felt that was, why? 
first of all, I make you feel safe. Mm -hmm. uh, I could give a list of examples, but sure. there are things that she's brought up of things that I did for her sure. that she was, oh, it was above mm -hmm. and beyond. And to me, no, that was just the easy stuff. Yeah. Everybody does stuff differently. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Why do you need this made up rule? Yeah. Uh, which is making me think, well, people need you to prove to them that you are this thing mm -hmm. and then they will allow you to be the real thing. Mm -hmm. And it, it takes so long to get to know somebody anyway. Yeah. I've known you for a decade. I just found out you have a sister. <laughs> yeah. Why am I supposed to do this other yeah. thing? Yeah. But out of but the point is, it's also okay that this thing isn't for you. Yeah. But when you then later say, oh, no, it was for me. I just didn't give you the chance. I think to myself, yeah. Well, if I could do it again, what your, I wouldn't have gone in there yeah. and, and, you know, been a good Christian boy. Yeah. And not made, you know, fart jokes or whatever. Yeah. Anyway, that yeah. obviously it went on a little too much. Thank you for your patience. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, it's, it is tricky because, and you've said this a couple of times, like, isn't that manipulative? And I think it's understanding what this person wants and needs right now. And if you're willing to do that right now, it doesn't mean that you're establishing a precedent and it doesn't mean that once you do this, you're showing her or him or them um, um, how it is that you're always going to be. So when you talk about like dating, you know, yeah, show them that you're aware that, oh, I'm going to come pick you up. Show them that you're aware. That makes them feel taken care of. That makes them feel yeah. safe. That makes them feel yeah. important. And as the relationship goes on, and I, I don't remember what you said, if it was three months or four months or whatever, but. I, I think that, that the best way to have that conversation, you're not asking for advice. I don't know why I'm giving it, but is, is to, to, you know, that you guys have that conversation that night and you blow up and feelings get hurt and then just address it the next day when things aren't so charged. Yeah. I don't think it didn't, it definitely didn't blow up to yeah, feelings yeah, yeah, being hurt. Yeah. I actually didn't even realize the conversation until the yeah. afterwards. And I sat right. in it and I realized, right. Oh, that was her way of communicating her right. wants to me. Yeah. That being said, you know, three, four months in seeing each other two, three times a week when I'm 100% of the time picking up and dropping off, right. I feel like I have every right to say, of course. listen, th there's a responsibility that I'm happy to take on when I'm happy to take on it, but, you know, help me out here Yeah. to not have to drive you home at two in the morning all yeah, the time. Right. Yeah, right. Uh, yeah. The point of that is, as, you know, people, everyone has their wants. Mm -hmm. When I go into a poker game... And, you know, I, I, I will continue and have been getting better at understanding people's wants when they don't tell them to me. But when you don't say to me how you, what you want, but assume that I know what you want. Meanwhile, I'm showing you what I want. Mm -hmm. I don't know. It's just like it just feels like. It sucks. Yeah, it sucks that people assume that I could read their mind, but they won't listen when I'm literally telling them my wants <laughs> and who I am. Yeah. And, and that's where it gets to, you know, the equilibrium of friendship. And, yeah. but see, that's also you being 100% authentically. You is also what brings Blake Griffin to your apartment. And also, which also keeps it makes him get a, not want to work with me for a little bit. Correct. But, he came to your apartment. There's, 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 there's that thing about you. You'll know immediately if people are into it or if they're not. I don't. And they'll hang out with you. I don't if, pick up on it. Okay. If they hang out with you, they're we into it. We have friends yeah. who are close friends that I don't know how they feel about me. I don't know. Well, are they hanging out with you? No. Well, they can take you in doses. They can take you, you know, I can, I can, I can take Rick, you know because I don't know you, you bring with a lot of energy, you, you bring who you are to a room. Mm -hmm. And for some people that's like, yes. And for some people it's like, Whoa, who does he think he is? Like, he doesn't know me well enough. This, this isn't his party. He shouldn't be dancing in the middle of the dance floor. This isn't his wedding. But that's what you do. And that's what I was saying. I, I, I like, I like that you show up uh, at somebody else's party, somebody else's holiday dinner with their but family. I know you, but you don't know them. I'm with you. You're the one who makes me feel safe. Can I say something that yeah. I think is actually a, a, a very romantic statement? When I go somewhere, I'm also with me. 
and this is who I am, uh -huh. and I want to dance. Uh -huh. You're okay to dance with me because I accept you. Yeah, I'm okay to dance with me because they don't tell me that they don't like it. Uh -huh. <laughs> you know? Uh huh. So I don't know. But that's what makes you extremely attractive to a lot of people. And you're gonna you're gonna make some other people feel uncomfortable. Fuck them. Like those aren't your people anyway. Yeah. You know, like they're boring, or, or like they don't get it. Fine. Like that. Being, you're not my audience. Being boring. Is the worst. Isn't a sin. Yeah. But if you remove the sins, <laughs> yeah. it's the it's yeah. it's the worst. Yeah. 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 Uh, Mark Cuban talks about how I, I like this. It's a product and I like it and I'm a customer, but it's not investable. It's not a business. And for me to scale this, it would take too much work for me. It's not worth my time. I get it because an hour of his time is worth millions of dollars. Sure. I don't do a lot, so I can't really say I don't have an hour to do it. But when it comes to being boring is the closest I could feel to being a billionaire, where when somebody is boring, I cannot afford to spend an hour with them. <laughs> right. You know? Right. But what you need to understand is the majority of the world, people are boring. And you've, I have, I have, and you've accumulated, you've accumulated the small group of people in this world who aren't, and your family is not boring. So you have the expectation of, oh, everybody around me should be exciting, whether we're fighting or whether we're yelling or whether we're laughing or whether we're eating, or like at least interesting. Yes, yes, but not boring. Even if you don't, even if like you got in a fist fights with your brother, there's still action. There's still excitement. Yeah. Like, yeah, it hurts, but like this something's happening and so you're what you're used to where you feel safest or around people who make you excited whether it's good or bad the excitement is there you know like your your parents are the funniest people and the most loving people and the most interesting people your grand i mean your whole family not going to get into all that but it's just like yeah why would you not want to be around people like that i i wasn't until college that i learned that i always thought yeah moms and dads are funny no, I, I've learned that when I got older, and yeah. that gave me a different appreciation for yeah. how funny my parents are. But that's an interesting thing that I need to be around people who are engaging, interesting, mm -hmm. funny, smart, strong points of view on something, entertaining, whatever it might be. That I think I'm almost positive when I'm having a podcast with somebody and we are not interesting. If I'm not interesting and the other person is, then. I could hide behind that because the product is interesting. Mm -hmm. But if, but it's my responsibility if they're not in a moment. And I put, I put too much weight to it. And I think when I'm finding myself in moments where things are breaking and it's boring and not interesting, I become so self-conscious because <laughs> I cannot stand being around boring. So when I become that, you know, you, yeah, uh, you, yeah, hate, yeah, yeah. you are the things you hate yeah. or whatever the thing yeah, may yeah, be. Yeah, yeah. That when I'm boring, especially when I'm boring and I'm saying, hey, guys, watch this. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's, a, that's, that's yeah. when I could spin. Yeah. And that's when I will overcompensate and have a goblin jizz yeah, on your yeah, mouth. Yeah, and it's like yeah. sometimes it's funny when it's, when it's earned. Yeah. But other times, I, the podcast has taught me. We've had this conversation about podcasts before that this isn't an hour special or for this episode, for example, a, a, a two hour plus special. This is Whoa. just a podcast. Yeah. And it's okay. And I, and I. I have gotten better at it, but it's hard to remember sometimes. Uh -huh. It doesn't have to be the most engaging. You can't be so engaging for a, a, a 90 minutes every week. Sure. When you turn the camera on sure. by accident. Sure. But yeah. Yeah. When it, but it's tough. It's tough when I, you take on the responsibility of. Am I boring? You know, right. it's almost as if to say, I would rather you. Kick me out of your poker game because I'm too much than being boring, which ultimately you're okay. And now that's not a conscious decision. And yeah, I don't yeah, believe yeah, that. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I don't understand. believe that. I understand. But just that. Uh, and since that poker game, I have come into a lot of self-awareness yeah. uh, where it's not only okay to chill back, it's attractive. Yeah. Um, but I have to tell myself. I have to tell myself like, uh, like when... Uh, uh, when you have a meter in a game where you, you cr you're approaching too close to th th this, yeah. you can't go over. You have to stop and let it recharge. Yeah. I c sometimes I have to tell myself, all right, Rick, it's time to, yeah. even though I have this energy of like, yeah. I want to. Yeah. I, I, I think what you're not a boring person. So you wasting energy and fear and anxiety over the idea that you might be perceived as boring or that you may even be feel boring in that moment, you're not. Like I could just sit here and watch you think and like that's not boring. Like you're 
you're very engaging even when you're not speaking because you're constantly thinking about something. Your mind works so fast. <laughs> Sentences. <laughs> your mind works so fast that sometimes you get ahead of people and they don't know how to get back into the conversation because now Rick is way ahead of me right now. Like, you're not boring. Could I uh, ask you a question through an example sure. of what you're saying? Uh, I've said each other's sentences that I could remember three times. Maybe yeah. there was a fourth. Yeah. Uh, the first two times I did it, you acknowledged it. Yeah. But you weren't sure what to do with it. Yeah. So you sat and you played the joke for a second until you got back five seconds later. Uh -huh. This one, for the first time, made you authentically laugh. Yeah. You didn't just get it, but it made you laugh. Yeah. So you were able to laugh and continue on. Yeah. yeah. What I think happened was by your honest laughter it didn't make you feel you needed to acknowledge me because you felt you did honestly yeah it actually made you laugh so you yeah. were continuing yeah but if it doesn't actually make you laugh yeah you have to okay i need to give something back yeah so it's tough to what people tell you is not useless but it's there's still algebra to be had Yes, but at least you're making them aware that you're aware. Yeah. At least you're letting them know, hey, I might say something that make you that makes you that makes you feel uncomfortable, but I'm letting you know that I'm going to say it, and I'm aware that it might make you feel uncomfortable. But then it takes away from the craft of comedy, of comedy, but not of being in a group of people that you don't know. Everybody. I'm talking podcast. I have oh, le great. I have less sorry, this sorry, issue sorry. interpersonally. Yes, great. Interpersonally now, great. S since I found out some stuff over the past few years, and yeah. I have. I, th I think I've gotten so much better. Yeah, I'm great. sure I'm still something like that. But yeah. it's podcasts where I am trying to show people, come into my living room with me. Yeah. This is just a conversation. Yeah. But the, it's framed in the truth, which is this is a product. I'm creating a piece of art. Yeah. And I can't just do it for them because then this isn't authentic. Sure. And, I, and I could just do it for us, but I choose not to because I want to make it special. Yeah. So I think you've, you've, you've found that that line i think you found that equilibrium and i think you're doing really really well and i think anybody that you ask would say the same thing thanks um do you believe that uh, i believe that it happens i believe that uh, on average this podcast is special uh i do however have a hard time with when things aren't special when i go bowling and I bowl. The but that's also what makes it good because you're so aware. Some people don't know that they're being boring. Yeah. But, Some people but don't that know that they're not being special. But that doesn't take away from the fact that they are boring. Yeah, and I'm not going to count them as things that <laughs> yeah. matter. In I, art. Yeah, right, right. So look around. Look how many. It's, it would be like saying in a very superficial way, mm -hmm. uh, it, when, if, if, if you're going on dates with girls and there's a girl who is, she's fine looking. Mm -hmm. And then someone would say, but on average, if you look at the whole world, she's a knockout. But yeah, all these people that I wouldn't consider for superficial reasons, you can't add them into the medium. They, I'm not counting them. They're, that would be like counting snails. Yeah. So when I'm looking at things that I like, art that I like, yeah. those are the only things, if comparing, and I wouldn't say that comparing is a big thing of mine, but yeah. it's, it, it's there. Mm -hmm. But when looking at what makes something special... All those boring things, th those don't matter. Yeah, those on scale. I'm looking at the 15 things that yeah. are special, that inspire, that are inspiring, that yeah. I don't want to be like, but yeah. be, but be wanting to feel I belong in. Yeah. You can't be boring, and that's not true because you, the truth is you can't be interesting all the time. Sure. Uh, but if you don't seek that special thing, you won't be special. Sure. But at the same time, if you force it, you get in the way of yourself. Yeah. That's great awareness. And uh, it's awareness of the obstacle, but I don't always have awareness of the, you know, the formula. But you're in constant search yes. of being interesting, being exciting, being entertaining, being funny. Some people just use their name or use their what they've achieved in the past to just throw a microphone in front of their face and think that since they have 10,000 people listening, that it's it's interesting and entertaining. But those are the snails that I don't that don't matter. Right. So just knowing that that you you're yearning for that and you have that that 
I guess, innate desire to be interesting and be exciting, like that's going to make you interesting, exciting because you know the medium. It might make me, but it hasn't yet made me. When I started doing stand up, I did feel special. I also didn't feel like I was a good stand up comedian. Mm -hmm. And I had enough confidence in knowing that I will be. It took me a long time to get to the point to where I feel where I am now. I'm a good stand up comedian. I don't feel that I've reached a level of that thing that gave me confidence, that consistency. In podcasting. As a stand up comedian, for, first of all. Uh, I, I'm, I'm equating being a podcast host with a stand-up comedian in the way where I'm performing out to an audience. Okay. So, though I finally got to the point as a stand-up comedian where I feel like I'm at least good enough, plus I have that fuel of every now and then there's something very special and I'm going to try and catch that. And if not, I'll at least have that sometimes. Mm -hmm. I'm, I am, as a podcast host, I feel like what keeps me going and putting in all this time is I feel like I am headed toward that thing. But I am not there yet. And when I taste it sometimes, which I do on this podcast, both in my feeling with the guest, the response from the guest, the type of people that want to be guests, yeah. and the reaction from the audience that, that, that validates my feelings already, mm -hmm. it then is like that same feeling of like having a nice car and then I need to have at least that car or better. I don't want to have... The reason I'm borrowing a car now is because... I can't afford to commit to the nice car I used to have, but it's hard to go back to a non-luxury car. <laughs> yeah. So being able to taste having these guests that want to be on, not only they want to be on, they, they talk about me to other people that I believe because I hear it secondhand. And yeah. it, when I don't have that, and it is not a, a good thing, but it's just I'm, I'm an imperfect person that, that, that recognizes and feels it, uh -huh. this wasn't special. Oh. And, and when it's not special, and maybe it is, by the way, I have posted some episodes that, that got a reaction, the strongest reaction that I almost didn't want to put out, which also gives me a little bit of confidence in knowing maybe people will like it. But when I don't feel something is special, I get things are breaking. Yeah. The other person is, is being professional, which yeah. there isn't a bigger turnoff to me than acting professional. Yeah. Being professional is different. Not to call them out, but yeah. just like... He, he, had, he even said, I've been on these things before. I know my job. I'm going to come in. I'm going to tell stories. Everything's fine. It, it's whatever. And I'm thinking, yeah, you do do this. So I need to get something out of you. I need to get something out of us that is different or more than what you've done before. And it it's, it's puts a lot of pressure, mm -hmm. which is very counterintuitive. Yeah, yeah. But that pressure is also what makes you good at what you do. If you didn't have that pressure and you didn't have that desire to make it special, then it wouldn't be special. Well, but, I, but just give yourself a break whenever you feel like it's not special for three minutes. <laughs> three minutes out of an hour. Uh -huh. You know what I mean? Yeah. Give yourself room to be like, oh, yeah. I mean, there's going to be. I mean, if, if you have five minutes out of an hour long podcast that's not special, bravo. 98% of the podcast was special and that 2%. Oh yeah. Well, that's going to happen. Being, you know, I can't say that I've never thought of this before, but maybe I'm being reminded then, but being boring. I, uh, is, a is a sin, I know. you know, it's abhorrent. Yeah. Uh, which is not true. Yeah. Some of the, one of the most attractive qualities of some of the funny people I know are when they are able to, I, I don't see it as boring yeah. when they're able to just like not be anything. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah. Well, I, I'll wrap this up because we've gone on for a while. Okay. Um, but also both to you and the audience with your permission, I would love to do this again and make do a podcast more about you. Great. Uh, so thank you. I can't, I can't promise that I'll be any more entertaining, but I will do my best. Do you have anything that you want to plug? Uh, the Wilds, of course. Yeah, The Wilds on Prime. Uh, Amazon Prime. No, Amazon Prime. People don't know Prime. Prime. I think it's just called Prime now, though, right? Yeah, people don't know it. You're right. Uh, Amazon, uh, The Wilds. Um, no, I already talked about it. David uh, Sullivan. I'm, I'm David Sullivan on Instagram. David Sullivan on Twitter, but I never get on it. But, um, and uh, where can people? Oh, get that I got mug? movies. I got some movies coming out. Uh, uh, 
the uh, movie called Monuments, which is making the festival rounds. Um, but where can people see it? Uh, I think right now it's at the um, it's at a Canadian festival. Which is the one where you play the dad that just won an award? Uh, yeah, that one is called Small Town Wisconsin. Um, and I think the next festival that's playing is Seattle. Um, these movies are really good, and I'm really proud of them, and they're winning a lot of festivals and awards but and stuff. But people can't see them. They have to log on to the actual festival website and then click to buy it and then watch it through the festival. But like as it goes to different festivals every weekend, you have to go to each festival's website. Does that make sense? Yeah. I mean, I'll put at least for the week this is up. You'll send me the links of sure. where people could find them. But yeah. if this has been up for more than a week or two, those links may not yeah. be working right. anymore. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks for coming over. Hey, buddy. Uh, also, I have to pee again. But if you want to chill for a little bit. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to eat and can I pee? Yeah, you, but actually pee, uh, inside this time. Oh, okay. Uh, I don't know if I've told people, but since I've moved, uh, I have a guest bathroom too, actually. Thanks. Patreon. And we have an official David Sullivan bathroom <laughs> because out of all my friends, David is the one that chooses to take a shit at my place the most. And I have had to say, because he lives close enough, I, I've had to actually tell him no. He has to go home to go poop. Not always, but during the COVID. Do you know how many shits I actually took in your bathroom? You've taken more shits in my bathroom than any other guest that I've had, by far, <laughs> including girlfriends that lived with me. Scoot-doo, blabbity-blue.